All right, so we, good morning everybody, or good afternoon, um, and um, good day, whatever that might be. Um, we are about to start, we're gonna give it another minute, we're letting people, uh, participants in, and uh, we're gonna get started. Um, just give us one more minute. <clears throat> okay. So we are um, ready to start again. Um, good. Uh, welcome from the control center. <laughs> we are uh, here for the third iteration of um, third iteration of the African case competition, Africa and the Middle East. For the Middle East, this is our second time around. Overall, it's our sixth uh, competition so far. And um, I, I, I just want to say we are equally excited uh, as the first time we we are um, we have a awesome lot of um, cases, and uh, we want to start this morning by once again reminding you that this is a collaboration across three different entities within the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Center for Global Health that uh, has provided a, a lot of support, Penn Medicine um, that provides, uh, aside from um, a time from staff and, and, and um, Farouk, my, um, my co-director, the, the department actually provides the funding that makes this possible and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that provides the rest of the team and some of the logistical support. So um, this morning, we are um, going to have uh, 20 cases, eight, what? 21 cases. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> after we selected the best 20 cases, we had a, a very last minute submission of a case that we couldn't pass. Um, but we cannot tell you which one is it either. So um, we're going to have 21 cases today. They're all great. And um, as uh, we hope that as interesting as and engaging, we're going to have a great keynote speaker and we're going to have in the middle, we're going to have a, an interesting panel discussion in a topic that has been, um, you know, uh, very important to us uh, here in the U.S., certainly for uh, all of us that uh, engage in global activities and that uh, Dr. Dago is going to is going to lead that conversation. So. Um, Haruk, do you want to say a couple of words before we get? I'm just excited as uh, thank you for for uh, getting things started, uh, Hansel, um, and and for your team over there. Um, looking good as usual. I'm sorry I can't be there with you guys uh, right now as as we usually do, but we're excited. You know, people are trickling in. I'm feeling the energy, so uh, let's let's get it. You know, let's get it on. So. Liz, um, right now we're gonna to transition to our keynote speaker, that is Dr. Amal uh, Saleh. And, and Dr. Amal is, uh, is uh, from Ethiopia. She works at the Black Lion uh, Hospital, or he used to, because I, I, um, I don't know how to make the differentiation uh, between um, or, or her ascent from being the head of the Department of Radiology at, um, Black Lion Hospital at uh, Addis Ababa University, to being the Dean of the School of Medicine, a very prestigious uh, post that I, I think uh, must be celebrated. She's also the President of the Council of Medical Schools in Ethiopia and the Vice President of the Ethiopian Medical Society. Um, Dr. Amal is also a good friend and a good collaborator and a good friend of the department and um, participates in multiple international activities. So she's gonna be, um, talking to us today and uh, welcome, Dr. Amal. Thank you for the kind introduction, Hansel. It's great to see everybody. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
so uh, thank you for having me. And um, the title that I chose coming from Ethiopia, uh, land of athletes, is I wanted to take this approach. So my title is the Athletics of Institutional Collaboration. Is it a sprint, a hurdle, a relay, or a marathon? So to start off, I just want to give a little bit of a background. Um, in undergraduate studies, uh, the residency program for radiology started in the 1980s. It didn't have its own department when it started, and it was under the Department of Surgery at the time. So to give a little background, this is uh, Professor Leslie Whitaker, and he started, he's a British expat actually, who came uh, to Ethiopia and started the radiology residency program. And the first cohort of uh, students to uh, train were six, and they graduated in, the 19, in 1989. So currently, we have uh, graduated over 430 uh, radiology residents, not at Addis Ababa University, but also uh, throughout the whole nation uh, of Ethiopia. So coming to fellowship, uh, so what was the need for fellowship? So there was a need for subspeciality training, mainly because of the advancement of radiology worldwide and the ever-changing world of radiology. And this, with the support of the department members at the time, Professor Asfal, who's pictured here, uh, was the department chair, and this is perhaps the beginning of the sprint. So he started discussions in the US and in Canada with Professor Korosh from the University of Toronto, with Professor Kasa Darke from CHOP, and Professor Patricia Hudgens at Emory. So this is where the sprint starts, let the games begin. So this is where establishing of collaboration started. So this is where uh, the department started to reach out to different collaborators. Convincing AAU leadership was very instrumental in starting collaboration and convincing collaborator institutes to join in and help with the establishment of the fellowship program. So, so to speak, it's throwing out the net and seeing what we're gonna catch with it. So there was also a need to prioritize. So priority setting, uh, it, we could not start all of the subspecialities at once. So department members collectively decided what to prioritize and depending also on the collaborators willingness to help. So the first uh, uh, radiology fellowship program was body imaging, which started with the University of Toronto under the leadership of Professor Korosh, who talked to Professor Asfal at that time. So this was a collaboration between uh, Toronto Addis Ababa Academic Collaboration, which was initiated in 2008. This was an extension of an initial collaboration in, two, in 2003 between the Department of Psychiatry and Addis Ababa University. So with this collaboration, the first two subspeciality training uh, fellows went to, the, uh, to Canada. And also Professor Kuros spent a lot of time in Ethiopia. And Professor Asfa was one, uh, the department head at the time and the first one of the first fellows uh, pictured here at the bottom. Then came cardiothoracic radiology and the first group was also trained and they were both faculty at our institution. Of course, uh, a leadership of, uh, uh, through the pro uh, leadership of Professor Korosh and of course, to name a few, Dr. Andrea and also Dr. Mini were very instrumental in starting the cardiothoracic radiology fellowship. MSK radiology, I apologize, I have no pictures because nobody was able to find one for me. Uh, so the MSK radiology started again with the help of Professor Korosh, who reached out to uh, faculty members uh, who were willing to, uh, to take up this role, uh, to name a few, uh, uh, Dr. Linda and Dr. Ali were uh, one of them. Coming to pediatric radiology, I think a lot, all of you know about this, it started with CHOP. So Professor Kasa Darge was very instrumental in this. And initially, uh, the need was to start uh, with the support of residency support, uh, residency support program, and also the establishment of the annual pediatric radiology CME, which we had our 11th conference in Ethiopia in 2013. But in 2014, the fellowship program started, and this included Professor Daniel, pictured here, and Dr. Uh, Yokabil, who were part of the team. And these are all the fellows who, are, who have trained under this program and also are in the process of starting their training, which is Dr. Lowell over here. Neuroradiology has kind of a tumultuous uh, history. It started with uh, the training uh, under the leadership of Professor uh, Patricia Hudgens. And initially when they reached out and communicated with her, she insisted that without MRI, there was no place for neuroradiology fellowship to be established in the department. And that push led also with other initiatives also, led to the need for MRI to be included in the department. 
And once the MRI was installed, the Neuroradiology Fellowship Program was a go. And with this, she had multiple visits before then, and she had seen our setup. And this is Professor uh, Pat, and we were one of the first, uh, was one of the first cohort to train under her. Of course, we also had Dr. Tugbam and Professor Getacho, who were already neuroradiology trained abroad and back in Ethiopia at, at that time. I just wanted to mention that it was important during that time, the residents were also coming to Ethiopia and uh, staying in our department. And these are some of the, uh, the residents who had come before we started our fellowship program. So when we went to Emory, it was really nice and it had a foster, it fostered a lasting relationship and a very welcoming environment when you go to uh, institutions for observerships. The hurdle comes in here. So the hurdle is when we had our second group of fellows joining in, we had a lot of challenges mainly COVID-19, which is a challenge not only for neuroradiology training, but also for fellowship training throughout the department. It was impossible for our fellows to go abroad to do their observerships, and it was impossible for our collaborators to come to Ethiopia and help out with the teaching. The other thing that is unique for the neuroradiology program is that the Emory collaboration ended. These are many, there are many uh, contributing factors to this, but mainly Professor Pat had left Emory and had joined uh, another institution, and we didn't have a championing uh, body there uh, for the uh, fellowship to continue. So we had two fellows who were in training already without a collaborator, so there was no uh, way we could send our, our, our uh, fellows for this uh, observership. So we had to improvise. What was the improvise? So it was quite a struggle to find collaborators to help out with this initiative, but under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Rihani, uh, who is the co-founder of Health for the World, in the last few months of their training, we were able to um, have uh, multiple uh, uh, neuroradiologists help out in their teaching process. To name a few, uh, Dr. Niki and Dr. Mariana were really great. Dr. Niki from UCSF and Dr. Mariana from an institution uh, in, the, in Switzerland were help, uh, helping out in giving didactic lectures and one-on-one -on -one case discussions. And these are our two fellows who managed to take their uh, external board exams and, uh, and passed with uh, uh, flying colors. So th this was the improvise. Following this, there was still a need to have a collaborator. And this uh, was initiated with the kind of direction uh, uh, by Professor Kasa to Dr. Uh, uh, Soyash, who was really instrumental in establishing the now uh, neuroradiology uh, collaboration with UPenn. So the MOU, it took about a year, just over a year to get it signed. But once it was signed, uh, uh, Dr. Soyash did an amazing job. He has been hands-on, on and on, and uh, he has been amazing in, in this collaborative effort. And he also even went uh, as far as to arrange for our fellows to be part of the uh, uh, RSNA-led regional meeting in Tanzania, which is pictured over here with our three fellows and one of our faculty members here. So the last uh, fellowship was uh, breast radiology. Uh, the department did have a need uh, to establish two more uh, fellowship programs that we thought were important. One was breast radiology and the other one is interventional radiology. Uh, through, the, through the help of Dr. Elsa Marie from the University of Oslo, um, there was a, an existing MOU between the University of Oslo and the Department of Oncology, uh, and they are the ones who actually established the oncology program in, at Addis Ababa University. But they had another approach of uh, having this breast cancer project where they thought it was crucial to incorporate uh, other uh, uh, important contributors to the care of cancer. So this uh, led to a discussion between Dr. Mer uh, Elsa Marie, who visited uh, our institution, and I was the department chair at the time. And we discussed that there was a very, uh, it was quite important that the advancement of radiology also had to be there for the uh, breast cancer project to be successful. And they were also interested in improving endocrine surgery, uh, including breast uh, uh, surgery and thyroid surgery. So the MOU was already there between the two institutions. So an amendment was made uh, between these uh, uh, to include radiology in this program. So the curriculum is in the final stages of being developed uh, and we will have a stakeholders meeting in the next coming weeks. So the curriculum has been shared with uh, external uh, reviewers to put in their contribution and we will hopefully uh, have this up and running hopefully in January of 2024. So this was a site visit at the University of Oslo uh, about a month ago, where the department chairs of three departments, oncology, 
uh, surgery and radiology, as well as the management team to see how things are done in the University of Oslo. So now the relay. So we have to pass on the baton. So this we have to do one locally. So one example that I wanted to give was to help establish and support radiology residency program. Uh, the uh, Bahardar University uh, had already started a radiology residency program, but needed our faculty uh, to uh, help out. So uh, different uh, department members uh, used to go to uh, Bahardar University to give uh, uh, their uh, didactic lectures and do case uh, uh, discussions as well as be involved in their uh, external examination for a re residency program. And also we are in talks with the Bahardar University uh, to, to start a kind of a hybrid program where uh, they would be the owners of their own fellowship programs, but we would be the collaborators and we would be uh, going there to give didactics and case discussions and they would also come to our institution as well. So this is one of the things that, of giving back uh, uh, from what we have. The other relay is also regional. So I'm quite pleased to say that this uh, 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 collaboration has worked really well uh, with the leadership of Dr. Karen. Uh, we were invited to be part of their uh, curriculum uh, review workshop. And uh, Professor Daniel and myself were there in Manguchi, Malawi at that. Uh, and we were uh, part of the uh, stakeholders meeting. And they needed a collaborator, so we had an MOU signed where it included uh, radiology, as well as other departments such as anesthesiology uh, and surgery in another capacity. But our main goal was to help establish the radiology, the first radiology residency program in Malawi. So the first professor to visit Malawi uh, was uh, Professor uh, Daniel, who's a pediatric <laughs> radiologist. So he was uh, uh, one of them, and these are the uh, fellows who are training. So we encouraged them, they wanted to start off with only training two uh, uh, residents, but we thought that it was a wasted effort and it would be better to train more. So it was decided that uh, Dr. Karen, who is in Blantyre, Malawi, and they would have another site in Lilongwe, where our faculty will be going to Lilongwe and to uh, help establish the program there. So two residents would train in Lilongwe with our faculty and two will be in Blantyre with Dr. Karen, and then we would switch them every few months. So this is one of the things that has worked really well and that we have helped establish this program. So the marathon comes in. This is the sustain sustainability part. It <laughs> you need a lot of endurance to have this uh, up and running and it takes a lot of work. Uh, it's important to train and retain uh, the, the faculty that is trained. And it is also extremely important to build trust. It should be a win-win environment and it should not be a one-way street. It should be a two-way opportunity. And I, I always insist that our collaborators should bring their students as well as their faculty. This gives the opportunity for students to see what is being done elsewhere. So this gives them, it broadens their horizon uh, they see cases that they would not normally see in their own setup. And this is very important. And this also uh, uh, um, fosters a, a feeling of belongingness when our faculty also go to collaborative institutions. And it's important to see familiar faces also in these places. And you have to start with what you have. You can't expect everything to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. But you start with what you have and you build on that. And of course, it takes dedication and passion not only from the home institution, but also for collaborators. Without that passion, this will not work. Sustainability, the support from colleagues. It's not just only the collaborators, but local and international colleagues that we have throughout the world and in our own country are instrumental in helping with fellowship programs. And of course, the further supports that we have from different annual meetings, the CHOP meeting that we have every year is quite important because we get a lot of faculty to come to our side of the world and see how things are done. And ASNR, particularly for neuroradiology training through the Anne Osborne Initiative, have had multiple uh, uh, visiting professors. Uh, two of them are pictured here, which I went into when we were at another conference. So this is Dr. Karina and Dr. Sandy from Australia and the US. And it's great to see them again because they're always willing to come back to our institution. So what is the current status uh, in our department? Who has been trained so far? So we have already trained seven fellows in body, four in chest, neuro four, uh, MSK four in pediatric five have already trained. 
and currently in training or about to start their training. We have two in body, two in chest, three in neuro. We don't have anyone in MSK yet, but we're trying to recruit someone there. And we have one in pediatric uh, radiology. So what is the current status of the department by itself? So where we were in the 1980s and in the 1990s, we had five faculty, four of which you see here and are in the faculty right now to where we are in 2023, where we have 31 faculty. And from all these people, most of them are, are uh, have their subspeciality training finished um, and also are probably in training and are about to finish. So we have 31 faculty now. What are the lessons learned? Not all collaborative efforts are a success, but you have to keep going. You have to look at the bigger picture and you never give, give up. So you keep calm and you carry on. So you must put in the work as well. So vision of our seniors and the passion of all is, has been very critical and that is one of the lessons learned. So the finish line, you have to make friends along the way. At least I did. And all collaborations always lead to new ones as well. And you also have to build bridges. So all of these, uh, uh, these are some of the pictures that, that I've taken uh, throughout my travels and presentations. And um, uh, Dr. Kilborn, who came to one of the CMEs from CHOP, uh, um, Dr. Savas, Dr. Karuna um, from CHOP again. <laughs> So we run a lot into a lot of job people when we travel. And of course, Professor Casa, uh, Dr. Abbas, Hansel, and new connections made with uh, Frank from Tanzania and Susan uh, and everybody else that we see all around the world. So these are friends you make along the way during these collaborative efforts. So I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, everybody, particularly those who have invited me to be on this uh, uh, on this panel. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I would also like to thank my colleagues and my, my friends who have shared their pictures and historical backgrounds, as well as all collaborators who have helped the Department of Radiology be where it is right now. As one of the countries in Africa, I think there are only five at the moment who have subspeciality trainings in Africa. Last but not least, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. And this is uh, Addis, and we welcome everybody uh, to Ethiopia. So you are all welcome. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamal. Like, that was great. It's, a, it's an awesome historical review, but uh, with a lot of emphasis on, on the things that, and I think that point that we keep making and that we can keep coming back to in terms of building bridges and, and um, and uh, trying to assure sustainability over time, I think um, your hospital and under your leadership and previous leadership, uh, it's been a great example of how to build those connections. Uh, but also very, very proud. And, and I don't think that we've celebrated, so, uh, um, we celebrated it like it was a, a win of our own when um, you guys were started supporting the residency in Malawi. We, we, we feel like, um, again, they, like, um, we're super proud that you got to a point where you started not not only being contained within the country, that um, where you do a lot to sustain other hospitals and universities around, but now it's a regional international um, support that you provide. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, Farouk, do you have a, anything for Dr. Anel? I'm just clapping. Um, I, I think that was an amazing uh, presentation. I didn't know you've done so much um, because you're so humble. Um, so um, please um, keep it up. We're proud of you. And we're looking forward to hearing from you in about an hour on the, on the panel. So hang tight, everybody. Thank you. All right. So we're going to um, get us started with our, with our cases. And for that, we're going to pass it on to Mohammed. Me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So our first case is from Malawi, presented by Dr. Kisomo Kadamanja. He will be presenting about a biopsy left internal carotid false aneurysm from Kamuzi University of Health Science. So, let's see. Hi, my name is Dr. Tsumura Namanja. I'm a radiology resident from Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, uh, Camus University of Health Sciences, <coughs> Department of Radiology. And my, my main is Dr. Karen Ketkut, and I'm here to present a case, uh, a near miss, a case of a biopsy left internal carotid. 
for aneurysm. So it's a case of a 64-year-old woman who presented with a painless, slowly growing left mass for 10 years, no prior history of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, TB, or any other neurological event. Was done a biopsy uh, on a, in a referring uh, hospital, but fortunately, the patient did not compensate, decompensate. The biopsy result was non conclusive, so they referred here the patient for a uh, chest x ray and also CT head, neck, and chest with contrast. And these were acquired. So the chest x ray was remarkable. This is a CT image uh, with contrast, it's actual uh, view. So we can see this abnormality here, which is measuring nine centimeters. So it has both hypo and hyperdense area. So this is the true, the true lumen, and the other one is the false uh, lumen, which contains the thrombus. And here we can appreciate that there's an area here where the puncture was done. This is the left common carotid. You can see it diminishes after this hypodense abnormality here. And you can see the right common carotid going upwards, dividing, bifurcating into internal and external and continuing, not on the left. And you can see this is the volume rendering image, which is showing the bifurcation of the common carotid uh, into the left internal and external. And you can see that the left internal is tortuous here and also continuing to this abnormal mass, which is the, uh, the aneurysm, and it's not continuing thereafter. We can here see this actual CT that the right cavernous segment of the right internal carotid is opacified, while on the left, it's not there. Uh, same, uh, but here we can appreciate the bo that both right and left uh, anterior cerebral are uh, opacified. And here, there is a small anterior communicating other, which is providing blood to the left side of the patient. And this is the reason why this patient is not having a, any neurological event, despite not having the left internal cavity. So no strokes or infarcts, because uh, this anterior cerebral brother here, the anterior communicating rather is providing blood to the side. So patient underwent surgery, ligation of the left internal carotid was done. He developed a stoparity ray, and uh, uh, 48 hours later, another CT brain with contrast was requested, and which showed all of wide arteries in the cell of Willis, of course, except the left internal carotid, which uh, uh, disappeared soon after the survival segment. So, uh, uh, we can see that a uh, healthy signal behavior in a low resource setting is not that good. You can imagine it took 10 years to assist this patient. Uh, uh, and also, before any interventions, it is very important that surgeons and clinicians should characterize uh, masses properly, more especially these neck masses. So, through clinical uh, history, examination, and the like. So, also as radiologists, we have uh, role to help our uh, colleagues to understand uh, data. Let's say understanding the uh, set of wheelies uh, and then provide the surgeons with information on how to, uh, go, to go about the surgery. Also, 3D volume rendering helps non-radiologists, uh, clinicians to understand the anatomy data, also pathology data, and therefore also helping them in the planning of the surgery and also it is very important to collect and diagnose uh, uh, and characterize aneurysms, such as true or false aneurysm, and not to mistake them with, uh, let's say, tumors. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Dr. Tsuma. Moving on to our second case by Dr. Zerihun Hailu. He will be presenting a case of communicating bronchopulmonary forgot uh, from the Black Lion Hospital at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. So let's see what we have. Uh, 
Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Zarim Kalashi. I'm a third year radiology resident at uh, Achaba University Black Line uh, Hospital, uh, Ethiopia. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present uh, this case entitled uh, Communicating Bronchopulmonary uh, Forget Malformation. And this, is, uh, this presentation is uh, done in, in collaboration with uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Samuel Sisa, a pediatric radiologist at uh, Black Line Hospital. And uh, with, this is also with other team members uh, from a pediatric uh, uh, surgery department. We have no disclosures. And this is a male newborn patient presented with respiratory distress. And uh, the as initial workup, this uh, chest radiograph was done, showed this white out hemothorax. And on ultrasound, there was no, um, there was no uh, pluripfusion. It just uh, showed uh, this hepatitis lung with uh, air bronchogram and uh, for uh, diagnosis of pneumonia, empirical antibiotics were started and the first investigation with echocardiography revealed also atrial uh, septal defect. But despite this uh, treatment, patient failed to improve and the first investigation was done with uh, CT, uh, post-contrast uh, chest CT. And uh, as you can see uh, on this uh, CT, the right uh, uh, lung is uh, completely in, in an aerated, and uh, the right main stem bronchus is not visualized, and there is no uh, evidence of right main stem bronchus. And additionally, there is a suspicious air fossa in the right uh, paramediastinal uh, lung at the area of the esophagus, and uh, for suspicion of some fistulous communication between esophagus and lung, uh, a contrast study was um, recommended by a pediatric uh, radiologist. Uh, on the, this post contrast uh, chest CT, we do have this associated finding, including uh, hypoplastic right main pulmonary artery. Uh, on a closer look, the pulmonary arteries are asymmetric, smaller on the left side. Now, I mean, sorry, on the right side, and um, there is also additional this uh, uh, abnormal uh, systemic venous drainage of this uh, lung into the suprahepatic IVC. So these are associated findings seen in the uh, same patient. On the recommended uh, uh, GI contrast study, there is this um, uh, tracheobronchial tree uh, contrast field the tracheobronchial tree within this abnormal lung, communicating with the lower esophagus through this. Um, um, uh, abnormally located uh, bronchus, uh, which is uh, suspected to be replacing the uh, missing uh, anatomic uh, right main bronchus. So this was uh, diagnostic for uh, communicating bronchopulmonary forget malformation. And uh, after this, a patient went underwent uh, surgery, and this is an intraoperative uh, image showing uh, area of communication between uh, this abnormal lung and the esophagus, not uh, seen in this uh, uh, picture. And this is a post-operative uh, uh, surgical specimen of this abnormal lung. So uh, coming to the discussion, communicating bronchopulmonary forget malformation is a patent congenital communication between the esophagus as well as the lung. And the abnormal lung between this esophagus and the abnormal lung is known as esophageal bronchus. And the lung by itself is known as esophageal lung. In the term encompassing all of these pathologies known as this uh, communicating bronchopulmonary forget malformation. And this is a separate entity from tracheoesophageal fistula in which the communication is only at the level of uh, track between the trachea and the esophagus. Here in this case, uh, the, so the communication is between the esophagus and directly with the lung. And as uh, to the incident, this is a very rare uh, disease with only 70 cases uh, of case report have been uh, documented in the English literature uh, globally up until now. And uh, because of this recurrent aspiration into the lung, patient can present to this car, respiratory stress and recurrent, recurrent pneumonia. And uh, patients are usually uh, diagnosed at the early age of uh, life. And but there is there are these reports in which this condition has been diagnosed in adulthood in the age of uh, around the age of uh, 20 years. And according to uh, Srikanth's uh, uh, classification, we do have these four types of um, communicating bronchopulmonary forget malformation, in which um, the, the type 1 is uh, associated with an additional association of tracheosophageal, I mean, uh, 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 fistula or uh, atritic uh, proximal esophagus. And uh, this type 1 has uh, this uh, subtype, type 1A and type 1B. Type 1 uh, uh, A is uh, when the, this hypoplastic lung 
a plastic hole lung is communicating with the esophagus but type 1b in comparison is only a segment is communicating with the esophagus and the rest of uh, this type type 3 type 4 and type 4 has no uh, associated esophageal atresia and type 2 is just similar to type um, 1a and uh, without the presence of uh, esophageal atresia and type uh, 2 uh, i mean type 3 is uh, similar to type uh, 1b without esophageal atresia and in which only a segment of lung is communicating with the esophagus and the type 4 is the mildest of all and it has uh, this um, uh, normal tracheobronchial anatomy with uh, only a small uh, area of communication between the normal lung and the, the esophagus and among these the third type is the commonest and our patient uh, has this uh, second type which is uh, uh, the second commonest uh, type of uh, communicating bronchial malformation and there are multiple other associations including uh, abnormal blood lung blood supply drainage and uh, supply and in addition the mediastinum the great the great vessels can also be uh, abnormal and extra pulmonary associations include cardiovascular abnormalities bacterial association skeletal and rectal as well as uh, diaphragmatic uh, hernia and treatment is pneumonectomy which is said to be curative and better outcome is for patient who has no comorbidity no congenital anomaly as well as for patient who are diagnosed early on and again, uh, reconstruction has also been uh, being tried, in which this uh, abnormal uh, bronchus is uh, 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 transected and reimplanted into its normal anatomic location, and uh, this is uh, this has said to have uh, high mortality, and not a recommended mode of uh, treatment. In this patient, the final diagnosis of uh, type two communicating bronchopulmonary forget malformation with an associated anomaly uh, were made in those anom associated anomalies including hypoplastic right pulmonary artery, pulmonary system immune drainage and arterial septal defect. And for patients to have a better outcome, early diagnosis is uh, quite important and for early diagnosis, eye index of clinical suspicion is quite uh, important. And uh, this is all we have for the, uh, this case and uh, these are the selected uh, references for this presentation. Thank you very much. The second case is from Tenwek Hospital from Kenya, where Dr. Ndaro Daniel would be discussing a C spine tuberculosis case. Hello there, my name is Ndaro Daniel. I'm your surgery resident from the Tenwek Hospital, situated in Bomet, Kenya. Uh, my mentors are doctors uh, Williams and Hatang. I'll be presenting on a complete recovery for spinal cord decompression uh, surgery, a case of C-spine TB. So this hospital is situated to the southwest of the country, serving a population of about 4,000 uh, people. Um, spinal cord compression for patients with a medical uh, uh, research council that is MRC uh, strength grade. Uh, three and above are uh, likely to recover their ability to mobilize uh, post surgical decompression. However, those are uh, less uh, than two or two and below are likely to achieve independence in walking. So, we have a case of uh, we had a case of a 31 year old woman who uh, with no mobility who presented with a six month history of a neck ache, a progressive weakness, and altered sensation of the upper and lower limbs and uh, bowel and bladder incontinence. She initially presented at our local hospital with a clinical radiological findings are consistent with a TB. So despite management with anti-TB medication, bed rest and soft collar, a neurology worsened and a CT of the C-spine showed a loss of anterior support for massive osteomyelitis and epidural collection causing anterior cord compression with posterior bone involvement. As you can see in these images, uh, one to your far left uh, one with contrast, uh, you can see uh, the epidural collection anteriorly. Then when you look at this uh, one at the center, you can see the bone involvement uh, that the vertebral bodies have been eaten up and with that epidural collection, as you can see on the left side, then that is still confirmed on the MRI uh, to your right. You can still see the clear demarcation of the epidural collection and uh, the signal ch uh, changes, that is uh, intensity changes on the, on the cord. Uh, signifying the impact uh, the lesion had on the cord. Uh, so uh, overcoming the financial and traditional limitations, uh, she traveled about 450 uh, kilometers 
despite her paraplegia and attribute, she had a strength of 0 0.5, uh, 0 over 5, sorry, uh, in her lower limbs. And uh, at mitom C5, she had a power 5 over 5, and uh, C6, she had 3 over 5, and C7, she had 2 over 5, and uh, C7, C8 to T1, she had 1 over 5. Sensation distal to the compression was reduced and had a blood and bowel incontinence. Both Asia and frontal uh, scores were at C. So surgery was offered uh, to preserve the little hand function and improve the neck ache that she had. This posed uh, some significant risk with her life, making her opt out. Uh, so she was already leaving the hospital with her relatives and they were wanting her to just go at home and, and purge. But she met one of her social workers who encouraged her to just uh, bear the risk and uh, have surgery done on her. So two-stage surgery was planned uh, to reduce the length of anesthesia and also assess her ability to self-ventilate uh, postoperatively. Uh, so this was uh, uh, the first time we had uh, we anterior compectomy. A compectomy had been done. That is the, in the first uh, stage of the surgery. Uh, you can see right there, uh, compectomy, and uh, and uh, one on the right. You can see the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, fixation that was done. Of note is that. Uh, his post her post stop uh, cause was okay up till about uh, 24 hours later when she uh, complained of uh, neck pain, uh, despite the fact that she was already uh, gaining some strength. So the concern we had concerns and we elected to do uh, repeat imaging, of which revealed uh, that uh, the screw at C3 had uh, was poorly uh, poorly purchased, as you can see right on this red arrow. Um, yeah, so um, we elected uh, to take her in and. Uh, this, at this point in time, we went back and devised the arterial uh, fixation, and also uh, later went uh, five days later went ahead and did the posterior fixation, um, of which uh, overall uh, you can see the uh, anterior fixation right here, and also the posterior one. Uh, and you can also see on the AP uh, view of, of the SEM. So uh, the patient did well uh, postoperatively, and uh, currently uh, that is uh, three months out. She's currently able to ambulate and uh, uh, that is ambulate slowly, uh, stand and ambulate slowly uh, without any support. And uh, the plan is to continue with uh, the TTBs up to one year and then uh, we shall keep reviewing her and also do imaging just to see how she's doing. So management of spinal cord uh, injury patient from different etiologies still poses a major challenge in low middle income countries and uh, a surgeon should consider the compression and stabilization even when patients are paraplegic, provided there is some motor and sensory function below the level of compression. Prognostic outcomes are more favorable in a TB cord uh, uh, compression than traumatic and metastatic compression. Yeah, thank you. Uh, those were my references. That was a really interesting case from Dr. Ndaro Daniel. Now moving on to our fourth case from Tanzania by Dr. Hamim Rusheke, who will be presenting a case of an intraorbital wooden foreign body from Muhimbli University of Health and Allied Sciences. Hi, my name is Hamim Rusheke. I'm a second year neuroradiology fellow from Muhimbili University of Health and Allied Sciences, uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I'm presenting a case titled Delayed Presentation of Intraorbital Wooden Foreign Body Mimicking Fat on CT. A 39 years old woman uh, presented at the OPD with a complete visual loss on her right eye for two months. This happened following an accident of falling on a center ground two months earlier, during which she sustained trivial injuries on the right side of her face. She reported to have developed visual loss on the right eye one day post injury. She also noted past discharge from the site of injury seven days later, which subsided within a week. She denied the history of any penetrating injury to her right eye. On a physical exam, she was found to have mild swelling on the right upper eyelid with a scar tissue on the surrounding area. There was no fresh wound and there was no past discharge. On a orthomagic evaluation, she was found to have visual loss on the right eye. Therefore, the clinician had a provision diagnosis of traumatic optic neuritis and orbitocellitis. And on investigations, uh, her biochemistry and the hematological uh, profiles were normal. And CT scan of the head was requested. And uh, these are the actual CT scan of the head from the same patient at the level of the orbit. On the left, we have uh, 
soft tissue window and on the right you have bone window. The finding on CT was a tubular structure on the medial extraconal compartment of the right orbit that appeared extremely hypodense compared to the surrounding structure and it was appearing of the same density of similar density are the frontal sinuses and this uh, tubular structure appeared to extend from the orbit and uh, through the orbit apex to the right middle cranial fossa as you can see on the slice below this one is this is the lower slice you can see how it extends and the density of this uh, same tubular structure on bone window appeared hyperdenser compared to the frontal sinuses uh, uh, concluding that, that it was into air, it was rather of a fatty density, as you can see, it was of the same density as the uh, uh, the orbital fat on the ex extraconal spaces. Therefore, we had the imaging differential diagnosis of intraorbital foreign body and mild orbital cellulitis. And the consultation was done to both ophthalmologists and the neurosurgeons, and the patient was planned for surgery. And these were the intra-operative mm -hmm. findings. Mm -hmm. A thin wooden stick was removed from the right eye, from the right orbit, and uh, it measured uh, around six centimeter in, the, in length, and there was no significant intra-orbital or intra collection. And uh, on post-op, the patient had a remarkable improvement, was discharged on the third week. However, the visual loss on the right eye persisted, and the patient was referred to the ophthalmology clinic for further evaluation. And the control CT was done three weeks uh, later, and it revealed normal findings. On discussion, uh, imaging of wooden foreign body may be challenging at times. In the acute stage, usually dry wooden foreign body may mimic air or fat. However, with time, the CT density of the wooden foreign body changes from air to fat to water and sometimes to soft tissue. In 2016, Uchino and colleagues described the CT findings of interorbital wooden and the bamboo foreign bodies in the acute, subacute, and the chronic stages. And they found that during the first and second days, uh, the wooden foreign body in the orbit appear hypodense relative to the surrounding orbit of fat. However, as the, with time, the wooden foreign body, uh, absor as it absorbs water from surrounding soft tissue, its density increases. And therefore, from the day 8 to 29, it appears denser than the extraocular muscles. Therefore, wooden foreign body in the subacute and chronic stage should be included in the differentials of intraorbital lesions of soft tissue density or above on CT of traumatized orbits. And if clinically suspected but not found on CT scans, MRI imaging may offer additional sensitivity for a non hydrated wood as they appear hypointense to fat on T1 weighted image. Learning points from this case. A high index of suspicion is necessary while evaluating patients with periorbital injuries because the presentation of this patient may be very late with the initial incident even forgotten. And uh, the CT appearance of these uh, patient or these uh, material wooden uh, foreign bodies would depend on the nature of the wooden material and the time at presentation for imaging. In our case, the patient gave only a history of falling on a center ground but completely denied the possibility of penetrating orbital injury. And these are my references, and thank you for listening. That was a really awesome case. So moving on to our um, fifth case from Ethiopia, uh, Dr. Miskanao Badege from Black Lion Hospital will be, will be presenting a case of ocular tuberculosis mimicking retinoblastoma. Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Msikano, surgery radiology resident from Tash and Tsaba University, Ethiopia. I'll be presenting a case of ocular tuberculosis mimicking retinoblastoma. Dr. Katia Omar is my mentor and Dr. Samuel, Dr. Taspa and Dr. Nebrato are uh, my team members. I have no disclosures. This is the outline of uh, my presentation. And uh, coming to the case presentation, the patient is a tears old male at Orler, presented with occasional generalized tonic clonic seizure of one year duration, dry cough and uh, positive TB contact history. And on physical examination, he was severely rested, severely underweight, and uh, tachypenic, tachycardic, and uh, 
febrile and there is a low stick offensive uh, right ear discharge and mild intercostal retraction. And on the laboratory, the CBC uh, showed leukocytosis with uh, lymphocyte predominance and SR was raised to the level of 30. And uh, early morning gastric aspirate gene expert was negative. And chest x ray was done and it showed uh, mediastinal uh, widening and right middle lung zone airspace uh, opacity. Uh, which obscured the right heart border and uh, with the patient's clinical history and contact history with tuberculosis uh, patient. Uh, it was considered as a primary pulmonary uh, tuberculosis and brain CT was done and the brain CT showed right uh, temporal parietal conglomerated ring enhancing collisions with significant fair lesional edema with uh, salsa effacement and right lateral ventricular effacement and uh, the center of the lesion was uh, isodized to the brain uh, parenchyma and at the level of the orbit uh, the right globe was smaller than the uh, left one and there was hyperdense heterogeneous enhancing uh, right uh, retinal lesion with uh, uh, hyperdense uh, foci suggesting calcification and abdominal ultrasound was done and it revealed multiple round uh, target like liver lesions with large aortic lymph nodes and this is a radiological diagnosis of dissemination TB to the lung, liver, lymph node and brain was uh, suggested and regarding the ocular lesion, retinoblastoma versus a part of the disseminated TB was considered retinoblastoma because of the calcification and the epidemiology, the age of the patient and uh, TB because of the brain lesions and other side uh, lesions, TB was considered and subsequently, the patient was started on anti TB and pyridoxine, and phenytoin was added for uh, the seizure. And at certain months of uh, follow up, the patient showed clinical, uh, significant clinical improvement and the almost complete resolution of the right temporal parietal lesion with brain volume loss and uh, calcified uh, lesion. And the ocular lesion significantly reduced in size, and the calcification became more obvious. And coming to the discussion, uh, TB is a leading. Uh, uh, communicable uh, disease uh, cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide and uh, CNS TB is the most severe extra pulmonary tuberculosis. The incidence of ocular TB has been a subject of controversy because of difficulties in ocular sampling for microbiology and inexact diagnostic uh, criteria. And some suggest a diagnostic uh, criteria for uh, ocular TB and it composed like the presence of tubercles composed of epithelial cells and giant cells, causation necrosis, acid fast bacilli, and the evidence of systemic TB are said to be a diagnostic criteria. And that failure to demonstrate acid fast bacilli is not considered to be evidence against TB by many authors. And regarding inoculation, it is commonly done because of uh, mistakes like considering uh, the lesion as a retinoblastoma and sometimes if the A is painful and without useful vision and there is a diagnostic dilemma, uh, inoculation can be done but both of these things are not uh, done in our patient because of the patient's uh, IOS functional and uh, still TBOs in the differential. And the presence of systemic tuberculosis, it strongly indicates uh, but does not prove that TB is a cause of the ocular uh, findings. Neuroimaging can be used on diagnosis and uh, follow-up, but still uh, clinical uh, follow-up is uh, very uh, important and the neuroimaging provides an invasive means to improve diagnostic accuracy and detect complications. Uh, CT or, as well as MR can be used and CT because of its availability and it is fast, uh, we can use it but there is a risk of uh, radiation. But, uh, in, in case of MRI, it is uh, Excellent uh, soft tissue uh, resolution and uh, absence of uh, radiation uh, makes it preferable, especially in patients having follow up and in pediatrics. But the issue is the case the, it needs uh, sedation in pediatrics. So, the take home messages making the diagnosis of ocular TB is a challenge, still because of a lack of comprehensive evidence on this topic. And TB can present is intraocular mass use calcification, and the ocular TB should be considered in the differential diagnosis of ocular mass in the, in the developing world, particularly in the presence of brain parenchyma lesions, mm -hmm. which is a common presentation. These are my selected references. Thank you. Hello, everyone. That was an interesting case. Moving on to our sixth case from South Africa, from Inkosi Albert Luthuli Central Hospital, Dr. Nirvash Govender will be presenting a mural type vein of gallon aneurysmal malformation.
Sunny Bonani. Hello, everyone. My name is Navash Kavinder. I'm a third year registrar in radiology at UKZN Durban, South Africa. Thank you for the opportunity to present our case titled Long Road to Health, a Mural Type, Vein of Galen, Aneurysmal, Malformation, Case Report, No Disclosures. We begin by presenting our three year old male toddler with an uneventful birth and medical history is referred from the local clinic to his base hospital with the following problems multiple episodes of vomiting and no other danger signs in addition he had delayed developmental milestones in communication and on clinical examination his head circumference was above the 97th percentile the main clinical concern was hydrocephalus with raised intracranial pressure an emergency ct head showed a large intracranial space occupying mass causing obstructive hydrocephalus. He was referred to neurosurgery for further management and investigation at our institution. We performed a MRI that demonstrated features consistent with a mural type vein of Galen aneurysmal malformation complicated by chronic hydrocephalus and cerebral atrophy and no ischemic changes. The geographic representation shows the 260 kilometer referral path our kitty traveled from his local clinic to our institution below that is the world health organization head circumference for age the unique perspective our toddler showed was every south african neonate is issued with a road to health booklet that records the child's medical history health growth and development from birth to the age of five. Our toddler demonstrated delayed developmental milestones and progressively enlarged head circumference. Unfortunately, he was not identified during primary health care screening and was not referred earlier for evaluation or workup until he presented with symptoms. The barriers to health care services in rural areas are multifactorial global crisis that includes limited resources, poor health, education, and lack of health promotion. The image below shows the front cover of the current Road to Health booklet used in South Africa. Our images, MRI, T2 and flare axial shows a large left of midline extra axial mass measuring seven by eight centimeters centered in the quadrigeminal cistern with chronic supratentorial hydrocephalus and cerebral atrophy in the bilateral occipital lobes. On the same images, the mass demonstrates T2 flow and flare suppression. The additional sequences include the MR venogram, and it shows a dilated median prosencephalic vein that drains into a dilated tocula via straight sinus and no persistent falcine sinus. The last image is an MR angiogram, and this shows a mural type vein of Galen and erosmal malformation supplied by a single medial choroidal branch of the right posterior cerebral artery. The treatment of course included uh, endovascular intervention. A successful one-stage transanterior embolization procedure was performed with a combination of glue and coils. These digitally subtracted angiography shows pre-embolization and successful post-embolization with glue and coils. The toddler did excellent and was discharged home a few days later with a three month follow up and repeat imaging in November of this year. Pain of Galen and Rismal Malformation. Formation and anatomical classifications are summarized and illustrated below. The normal embryonic vessel structure is demonstrated in schematic A. An abnormal high flow AV connection is shown in schematic B. This leads to a dilated median prosencephalic vein and the formation of a vein of Galen aneurysmal malformation. The anatomical classification is derived from the angio architecture into two types, mural and choroidal type. In mural type, we have a single or more than one arterial feeder, direct high flow shunts on the wall of the draining vein normally presents later in infants and associated with hydrocephalus and neurological symptoms. They require less embolizations 
and achieve a higher probability of occlusion and better overall prognosis. The choroidal type are multiple arterial feeders interposing arterial network between the feeders and the draining vein, creating a shunt-like nidus anterior to the median prosencaphalic vein. Age of onset is normally earlier and in neonates and a more severe symptoms with high output cardiac failure, they require more embolization with a lower probability of achieving complete occlusion and a worse prognosis. The Road to Health booklet. This case highlights the importance of the Road to Health booklet as a simple yet highly effective screening tool for all children under the age of five in South Africa. The booklet helps to ensure our children survive and also thrive. It promotes good pediatric practices and effective care by bridging the gap between rural and urban healthcare systems with early detection, referral, and intervention. Thank you for your time and attention. Hope you enjoyed the rest of the interesting cases. These are my references listed below. Thank you and goodbye. Awesome case. So this is this was our sixth case this uh, morning. Uh, we're moving on to our seventh one. Just wanted to remind everyone that uh, after we're done with the tenth case around ten thirty, we're gonna be joining, uh, joined by Dr. James Alaro and Dr. Toma Omofoye to have a panel discussion about de de decolonizing global health. So uh, please stick around and. Now we're gonna move on to our seventh interesting case by Dr. Rashid Ngalawango from Malawi, who's gonna be presenting about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Hello, my name is Dr. Rashid Ngalawango. I'm a first year radiology resident at Kamal University of Health Sciences, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital Radiology Department, Malawi. And my mentor is Dr. Karen Ketkut, the biology consultant. I do not have any disclosures. I'll be presenting a case of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in, in a Malawian child. So my, my case is of a 12-year-old female who presented to our A&E as a referral with a two-week history of worsening cold fever and shortness of breath that had not been responding to antibiotics. There's no prior history of respiratory disease or any systemic illnesses. She was a referral from Nino District Hospital, which is one of Malawi's hardest to reach districts because of a poor no road network. So on admission, uh, an FPC was done, which showed the leukocytosis uh, with neutrophil predominance. We also did a chest X-ray, which showed a bilateral multifocal infiltrate, as shown by the paper arrows, and uh, which led to the diagnosis, uh, a provisional diagnosis of bronchopulmonary pneumonia. Which a patient was admitted in the pediatric ward or started on oxygen therapy as well as antibiotics. Whilst in the ward, patient was noted to be deteriorating. Uh, they had developed features of uh, respiratory distress, use of accessory muscles. As you can see, there are subcostal sessions, intercostal sessions, as well as uh, tracheal tagging. Uh, the saturations were also pretty low at this point, ranging from 50 to 60 percent. And the decision to transfer the patient to pediatric intensive care unit was done. Both in intensive care unit, our anesthesiologist struggled with intubating the patient only succeeding on the third attempt, and also noted that there were uh, there was blood as well as uh, mucus on the on the tube. Whilst in ICU, a clinical diagnosis of left lung collapse was suspected, an agent uh, bedside uh, chest X-ray was done, as shown on the image being projected. Uh, there was ipsilateral. Uh, midline shift as shown by the late arrow, as well as uh, homogeneous oversification of the left hemithorax uh, with a uh, loss of interleaf spaces as well, in keeping with the diagnosis of left sided lung collapse. At, at this point, deep sanctioning was done and some clinical improvement was noted right after. It is after that that uh, we decided to do a contrasted chest CT, below which are the images. So figure A shows a colonial soft tissue window, which shows a complete obstruction of the left main bronchus, as shown by the yellow arrow, measuring about 2.8 centimeters. Figure B shows a, an axial lung window, which shows a variable bi diffuse bilateral uh, bronchiectasis, which appears to be more pronounced on the left, in contrast to the light, as shown by the blue arrows. 
Pika si hizo se lang window, e colono lang window, showing a uh, showing further blanket association by the blue halos as well. Pika uh, si and D together as shown by the green halos shows uh, bilateral degraded input rates. And uh, there was also features of uh, left sided air trapping. As you can see, the left line appears to be darker compared to the right line. And also it appears to be more hyperinflated in contrast to the to the right lung as well. So at this point, a diagnosis of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis was made. Patient was uh, studied on amphotericin SMP. First and significant improvement was seen, uh, whereby the patient was uh, discharged from ICU to the wards and eventually sent back home on day eight for start studying the antifungal treatment. The plan was to follow up the patient in clinic. So a little bit of discussion on uh, uh, ABPA. Uh, so it is a condition of uh, exaggerated immune response to the fungus aspergillus. Initial X-rays are usually normal or demonstrate changes of asthma or pneumonia. So eventually bronchiectasis with mucoid infection in dilated bronchi develops, appearing as sausage-shaped or blanching opacities, what we call this, uh, the finger in a growth sign here in radiology. Uh, so sometimes it might complicate by pulmonary collapse as was seen in a patient who had developed a uh, left-sided lung collapse when they were in ICU. So uh, our speculation was that uh, there was a delay in the presentation of, of patient and it was unlikely that this was the first clinical episode as was uh, indicated in the history. It is more likely that the patient might have been unwell for some time but then did not present to the hospital due to the socioeconomic factors in most low and middle income countries whereby people tend to present late to the hospitals. Uh, so it's really unlikely that the child might have developed the bronchiectasis over a span of time with mostly having had multiple episodes of infective interludes prior to this clinical presentation which were not considered significant enough uh, by the family or may, may have been brushed off as simple airway respiratory infections. So there is a need for us to continue lobbying for a change in our health seeking behaviors, especially for our community members so that they present to the hospital on time. If we are to achieve to achieve the third sustainable development goal, which is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being of all at all ages. So in conclusion, there was, there was also delay on our part in patient management, at least in part due to radiology expertise constraints. Because Malawi has a total of four radiology consultants serving a population of 20 million, one of which is also an expatriate. And Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital only has one radiology consultant. To curb uh, this anomaly, uh, there has been an introduction of uh, a master's in radiology program at Kamu University of Health Sciences, of which the first cohort of four is in their first year, of which I'm one of them. That's all I had for you. Thank you very much. That was an awesome case from Dr. Ngalawangu. Now, um, don't forget that you can ask questions in the chat box. Just type in there and then we can uh, answer. Uh, moving on to our eighth case from Kenya, from Tenwek Hospital, Dr. Emmanuel Wekesa will be presenting a case of nasofrontal and phallocele with holoprosencephaly. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Emmanuel Wekesa, neurosurgery resident at Tenwek Neurosurgery Department, Kenya, presenting a case on nasofrontal and cephalocele associated with semiloba holoprosencephaly, a pioneer case report in rural Africa. The mentors were Michael Hutton and Hugh Peter Sims Williams. This is our training site in Kenya, in the rural part of Kenya, in the western part, Tenue Hospital. Encephalocells are neural tube defects that occur due to failure of neural tube closure during fetal nervous system development. All the presencephaly, on the other hand, are intracranial malformations resulting from failure of cleavage of the forebrain and midline mid, mid, mid facial structures. The diagnosis of the presencephaly itself is rare 
and the diagnosis of the association between the two is quite rare actually and is a diagnostic challenge in Africa. While we see a lot of a lot of sorry a lot of encephalocils, we rarely see a diagnosis of holoprosencephaly. The only case that I've reported of the association between the two that I was able to find is a case of a neonate who, who was diagnosed uh, as a twin and then was reported to have had surgery, but then later on uh, the patient died of sepsis. This I is what is part of my reference in the reference slide. We present a case of a one-month-old female who presented to us from rural part of Kenya with complaints of facial midline swelling since birth and leakage of clear fluid for three to four days, as well as vomiting. The patient was born in one of the poorest areas in Kenya to a 16-year-old mother who also had other children who did not accompany her to hospital this time round. The mom could not afford to transport to take the patient to hospital early on as from the time that she was born. In this presentation, the patient was brought to us through Red Cross services as a referral from another rural-based mission hospital. At presentation, the patient was micro, micro, microcephalic with facial swelling and crested skin with leakage of CSF. The patient was a febrile and was moving all fours, and the patient was awake and breastfeeding as well. LP demonstrated CNS infection. We went ahead to do a CT scan, and I now show the findings. The CT scan showed this mass of frontal encephalocele and shows features of corpus callosum agenesis. And here we are also able to see on the left side, we are able to see the ventricle in this left side. Uh, the lateral ventricle, you see the occipital horn that is not well developed occipital horn and the lateral horn as well, uh, which part of it goes into the encephalocele. On the left side, we demonstrate surgical planning where we show with the bone scans, we show the defect and how we will plan, we'll use that to plan for surgery. On this imaging, we demonstrate the anteriorly located sylvian fissure, which is indeed consistent with um, semiloba holoprosencephaly. Here we also demonstrate to you with this arrow the incomplete formation of the interhemispheric fissure, as well as incomplete separation of the thalami, the basal ganglia, which is a feature of semiloba holoprosencephaly. This is just a further explanation uh, showing rudimentary developed temporal horn and occipital horn on the same patient on the right side, on the left side, I mean. And this is the access scan demonstrating the pathology further. So the patient underwent surgery where we did a nasofrontal encephalocere uh, resection and we did a Dural repair to prevent CSF from leaking. We also covered the defect with a tiny bone just to prevent an advantage durotomy in the follow-up surgeries by plastic surgeon. And this here demonstrates the defect and what we were able to cover more as a protective mechanism. The patient did well post-surgically and recovered well and went home. The patient is currently breastfeeding well moves all the four extremities and has no focal deficits that you can see. And the take home message therefore from this presentation is that through careful study of intracranial imaging of patients presenting with encephalocele, more cases of association with semiloba holoprosencephaly can be diagnosed and surgical planning can be made of the CT scan. Also, successful relevant surgical repair is possible even in resourceful and limited setups. This was my reference. Thank you. These were some impressive, explicit uh, images. <laughs> um, so moving on to our ninth uh, case from Ethiopia, Dr. Abduddin Heru will be presenting a mucopolysaccharidosis in a five-year-old 
from St. Paul Millennial Medical College Hospital. So let's go. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to uh, Pain Radiology Global Health Imaging Case Competition Virtual Session. My name is uh, Dr. Abdul Dinheiro. I'm from uh, Ethiopia. I'm currently studying radiology in St. Paul Millennium uh, Medical College. So I'll be presenting on characteristic radiologic finding of uh, mucopolysaccharidosis in five-year-old uh, male child. So I would like uh, to give credit to Dr. Mohammed Abdullahi for initially uh, diagnosing uh, this case. I don't have any uh, disclosure. So this is a five-year-old uh, male child with uh, clinical history of uh, developmental delay. He's unable to sit unsupported and also he's unable to say mama uh, or baba. Uh, physical examination, the pertinent finding was uh, there was signs of malnutrition as well as macrocephaly was appreciated. So the clinician for assessment of uh, any brain parenchymal abnormality, uh, brain MRI was ordered. So the pertinent finding on this uh, brain MRI, as you can see, these are representative image, axial T1, axial T2, and coronal flare image. So the pertinent finding, we can see multiple uh, T1, hypo, T2, hyper, and flare suppressing sizes, which are consistent with in larger perivascular space or visual robin space. And also we can appreciate the significant cortical atrophy with widen uh, of the cell size as well as hydrocephalus was appreciated. In addition to this, on T2 and as well as player image, there is significant uh, white mother hyperintestines are appreciated. And on this uh, sagittal uh, image, we can appreciate there is a J-shaped configuration of uh, the cella, as well as we can see narrowing of the cervical spinal canal, uh, and also uh, um, there was uh, incidental adenoid tonsillar hypertrophy. So the finding of this uh, Cortical atrophy uh, in larger perivascular space, peri, uh, uh, ventricular T2 and flare hyperintensity, J shaped uh, cell, as well as the presence of this spinal canal narrowing, suggested that this could be a case of mucopolysaccharidosis, and uh, a series of uh, X ray was ordered. So, on X ray, on lumbosacar, we can appreciate the presence of this inferior beating of uh, the lower thoracic as well as lumbar vertebrae, and also hypoplasia of the vertebral body, causing uh, gibbous deformity was appreciated. And on and radiography, we can appreciate that uh, there is, as you can see, uh, a triangular configuration of the distal aspect of the proximal phalanges, which is consistent with uh, bullet shape configuration of uh, uh, these uh, distal phalanges. So these uh, findings, uh, the brain uh, yeah, MRI findings, the lumbosacral X-ray as well as the hand X-rays are consistent with mucopolysaccharidosis, which is a case of uh, inborn error of metabolism. There will be enzyme deficiency causing uh, polysaccharide accumulation. Clinical and imaging findings usually will depend on the uh, most affected organs and measurement of this glycosaminoglycan in the urine can help us in diagnosing uh, this patient, except in the case of uh, Morto syndrome, which usually doesn't result in elevation of this uh, uh, urine glycosaminoglycan. So imaging nowadays uh, has five, uh, in a very crucial role because of uh, it helps us in diagnosing as well as ruling out of this uh, different uh, differential diagnosis. So we have multiple type of mucopolysaccharidosis, uh, uh, Harler, Hunter, and uh, Morthos are the common one. So management wise, this patient usually will be treated with enzyme replacement therapy. This enzyme replacement will help us on uh, producing symptom uh, uh, improvement as well as uh, slowing of the progression. But uh, usually this enzyme will not cross through the, uh, through the blood brain barrier and the cognitive decline will not improve by administration of this uh, uh, enzyme therapy. So in our patient, the most likely diagnosis is Harler syndrome because of the presence of inferior beating. So uh, uh, usually this patient will die in the first decade because of uh, the cardiac will be also affected. Uh, usually we will appreciate the presence of this uh, valvular regurgitation stenosis as well as coronary artery will be affected. Unfortunately, in our patient, uh, this in uh, especially in Africa and Sub-Saharan regions, usually in the replacement therapy is not uh, available, and also uh, our patient cannot afford uh, for this enzyme replacement therapy. So, these are my references, and uh, thank you. Interesting case with descriptive images. Um, moving on to our final case from this, the first set. Uh, please remember that after this case, we're going to be joined by Dr. James Alaro, Dr. Amal Saleh, and Dr. Toma Omofoye to have a discussion about decolonizing global health. So uh, after this case, we'll be um, having this discussion. So now moving on to our 10th case from Nigeria, Dr. Uh, Mumini Wemimo Rashid, 
we'll be talking about a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. I'm Dr. Rashid Mumini Wemimo. I'm presenting complete androgen insensitivity syndrome with statolic self tumor in a 27 year old married woman. I have no financial disclosure. My case presentation goes thus. I'm presenting 27 year old married Nigerian woman who presented with history of primary hemenorrhea and eight month history of cultural difficulty. Her pregnancy and other history were all remarkable. There was a shooting history of dyspareunia and reflux ejaculates after sex. There was no history of urinary symptoms and no history of cyclic abdominal pain. There was no family history of similar problems. Clinical examination revealed well-developed breast in thinner stage three, absent axillary hair and paucity of pubic hair and bilateral ground swelling. Our female external genitalia was characterized by blind handing pouch. This, however, necessitated the use of magnetic resonance imaging, which demonstrated right and left in gonad an absence of molecular structures. She was further evaluated with use of um, hormonal evaluation, which revealed testosterone of 5.2 nanograms per mil. The reference interval is 0 0.2 to 0 0.9 nanogram per mil. The other parameters comprising of um, um, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, prolactin hormone, estradiol, um, and progesterone while within the reference interval. Sequel to this complete, the sequel to this diagnosis of complete androgen syndrome was made following hormonal evaluation, advanced imaging studies, karyotyping, which revealed XY chromosome and cytogenetics that revealed SRY gene. The patient, together with her parent and her husband, were duly counseled on natural history and principle of treatment of this clinical condition. She had um, bilateral orchidectomy and was accordingly placed on estrogen replacement therapy as well as serial vaginal dilatation and outcome was satisfactory. Figure one demonstrates right and left inguinal nodes. Y figure two showed absence of um, um, uterus and together with ovary. Figure three A showed um, uh, presence of XY chromosome. Y figure three B showed uh, presence of uh, um, X, R, Y gene. Uh, figure four actually showed, um, indicates um, right and left testes seen intraoperatively. Y figure five showed histology findings of the two testes with histology feature that is consistent with um, satolic self tumor sclerosis inference. Conclusion the patient was placed on um, estrogen replacement therapy. Together with um, serial vaginal dilatation, she now enjoys satisfactory vaginal intercourse. Um, take home message from this um, case presentation is that uh, we need to understand that um, complete androgen sensitivity syndrome is a rare X link disorder of is a rare X link disorder of sex development, which results from mutation in androgen receptor. The manifestation is highly dependent on degree of mutation. A majority of patients that present with this particular syndrome, they have um, female phenotypic appearance. However, they are genotypically male and they are often rich among their sibling as females. It is important to emphasize that exhaustive investigation is paramount in order to arrive at definitive diagnosis. The classical symptoms are primary amenorrhea with scanty armpit and pubic hair. The possible differential diagnosis is Meyer Rokistanki Costa Hausa syndrome, which should be excluded based on hormonal profile and cytogenetic study. The logical findings of absent uterus together with ovaries and fallopian tubes are very crucial with logical findings. Finally, it is important to emphasize that um, multidisciplinary approach is indispensable in management of patients with suspected complete androgen sensory syndrome. Thank you for listening. Another interesting case from Nigeria. 
with interesting images and pathology uh, report. So now um, we're gonna leave the space for Dr. Farooq to lead the decolonizing global health discussion. Good stuff, good stuff. Great, great cases so far. We, we're going to have a hard time on uh, choosing the best. Um, but remember, we have another 10 to 11 more after the, the panel discussion. So I'm just going to, um, I think we all, we have all our panelists over here. I see a Calaro with his um, nice um, outfit representing um, Kenya. Are you from the Maasai tribe? No, no. man, from the Luo. Oh, from the low, I should have guessed, <laughs> guessed. And we have Dr. Omofoye as well. Um, thank you for um, joining. Um, and um, last but not the least, we have uh, Dr. Noor. Um, so these three um, panelists were specifically chosen um, to create a, a balance. Um, um, Dr. Alaro is the scientific uh, program uh, director in uh, the Center for Global Health. Um, so, so he has that perspective um, from the NIH. Uh, Dr. Omofoye is a strategic um, director for breast imaging at MD Anderson, right? So she has the academic perspective in the U.S., as well as being a member of the diaspora community. And Dr. Noor, as you heard from in the morning, is a dean of the medical school, of the medical school in Ethiopia. So she definitely brings a, a unique perspective. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to jump right into it. Right. The topic is decolonizing global health. There's been a lot of talk about it, but I'm going to start by asking Dr. Omofoye, what, what, what is this movement about decolonizing global health? And what does it mean and why, why right now? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Daco, for having me here. Uh, thank you as well to Dr. Alaro, Dr. Noor. It's an honor to be seated with you all. I look forward to hearing your perspectives and learning from you. Um, I'm, as Dr. Dako mentioned, a Nigerian American. So I was born and raised in Nigeria, but completed my college and postgraduate mm -hmm. medical education in the United States. And so even though I have the opportunity to participate in global health as somebody who is technically from the, the global South, um, I feel like I would continue to straddle both cultures. The concept of decolonizing global health is that Ultimately, the underlying structures, the underlying systems, policies, and procedures that are at the foundation of global health work are set up to favor the global north. So even though people are going into global health work with a mindset of altruism and with a feeling that they are somehow contributing to, quote unquote, a weaker system, the truth is that there are structures that were put in place to systematically weaken the global South. And sometimes even with our best intentions, because the work is important, um, we can unintentionally contribute to those structures. So for example, global health as a, as a field really began as what we call tropical medicine, which is the, the whole theme of that uh, specialty was how to prevent expats from becoming infected with diseases of the tropics. And so even though tropical medicine has gone through so many transformations and so many of the transformations have tried to try to balance out who's benefiting, it's not just Foreigners should benefit when they are living in the global South. Let's also figure out systems that allow, you know, in-country partners to benefit from the work that's being done in healthcare there. A lot of the systems really were set up so that the benefit belonged to those who were, sorry about that, belonged to those who were from the global North. And so there is a saying that until the lion learns to speak, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Because global health, the publications happen in the global north, the, the um, funding sources come from the global north, all of the stories around it really are centered in the global north consistently. And so as we've seen more and more prominence from researchers, academics, individuals in the global south that are now sharing their perspective of global health, this new system, this new uh, paradigm around decolonizing global health has become more important. And I think when the COVID pandemic happened, it just blew the whole thing out of the water. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for um, um, introducing the topic. You know, I think a lot of us are not really familiar with the topic, so I think that was a great uh, introduction. I'm, I'm just going to have um, Dr. Noor um, sp speak next as, as a dean of a medical school in Ethiopia, right? What is the conversation about this sort of topic in, in Africa? Because we know it's often different in different regions, right? So, what you know, it, and it might not be using the same term as decolonizing global health, but what are, what are the sort of conversations that you guys are having over there? Um, when I first heard the term decolonizing global health, uh, I haven't heard much about it before. And I started to read up on it and wanted to know what exactly uh, it meant. And um, it's quite interesting. Um, first, I have a, a mixed feeling about the word decolonizing global health. And from a coming from a country where, where we were not colonized and being the only country that was not colonized in, in, in Africa, I think Ethiopia might not necessarily understand the word decolonizing, but um, the effects of what is being discussed is there for sure. I mean, um, uh, research that is being done uh, is uh, donor driven in some uh, respects and so forth. But I think uh, changing the narrative is also important in, in my view by saying that maybe thinking about equity in terms of decolonizing might be a, a better term to use, not to change what, what it means, but to make it palatable and bring the discussion uh, forward and um, and make it easier to to discuss because it is an uncomfortable uh, topic to talk uh, to talk about I think for most people um, and as a dean I, to be honest I haven't, I haven't come across this this topic maybe because I'm not in the school of public health where more of the research is being done and more of the funding comes and, and all that. But we do have a lot of projects and we do have a lot of grants that people are applying for. And those are of course restricted to what the donor or uh, the uh, agents behind the funding uh, um, are putting forward. So um, I think the name is different, but the problem is pretty much pretty much the same thing I would I, I would think. Thanks for that. And moving on to Dr. Alaro, you know, obviously you work in the NIH, so you work for the US government, I think. Um, what are the conversations like, um, first of all, in the NIH, and then second of all, in your overall experience interacting with academics in the diaspora, as well as back home regarding decolonizing global health? Yeah, so thank you, uh, Dr. Dako, for inviting us to this uh, panel, and uh, thank you to the fellow panelists who uh, really, uh, like uh, Dr. Noah says, I'm, I'm always learning. So I'm from Kenya. I did my early training, including bachelor's degree in Kenya, and then came to the U.S., and I work at the National Institutes of Health with the National Cancer Institute at the Center for Global Health. I... I'm almost taking the perspective of, uh, of Dr. Noah in the sense that I think I understand why she's not hearing the discussions around global health. Because I don't think that in Africa, global health is a thing, right? Global health is a creation right. of the West. Right. And therefore, when we are talking about decolonizing global health, even the term itself, when you're talking about global health itself, I don't think we mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Often, the people from the West who are in this area, be it tropical medicine, whatever else, international medicine, they've gone through names, right? Mm -hmm. Often, those people are referred to as global health experts. Right. But then Dr. Noah will be referred to as a local expert. Right. So I don't know what global health means. But if I take it from my perspective, I think that global health is a creation of the West. I, this topic bothers me quite a bit because I don't know. So we are talking about decolonizing global health. When, when, when were we involved in the topic of colonizing global health? 
So that then brings me back to the question of what are we doing about it, right? What are we looking at it? So if I was not involved in the discussions to even understand how that global health was colonized, somebody created that system, somebody perpetuates that system. And therefore my worry is that the people who created the system that perpetuates these inequities that we all understand are also now in the front of trying to create the solutions. And I, I, I and that is why we are not talking about what they did to really make us understand how they colonized global health so that we can decolonize it. The framework through which I think about decolonizing global health is their creation. The education system, the way I think, the way I talk, the way I interact, everything. So I'm involved in a discussion of a system that I did not create. And I'm being made to feel like I'm talking about decolonizing it, yet I don't understand how it was colonized to begin with. So I'll come back to the equation, sorry to go around, of do we have this kind of conversations at NIH? And I want to preface that by saying that I'm not speaking for NIH at this point. These are my own thoughts. So I don't want to get into trouble. And the answer is yes, we are having those discussions at the NIH. And when you look, uh, if, if people who are familiar, uh, Donella Maddows talked about leverage points. Sp places in the system is a ladder, is a hierarchy, starting with the lower side of the hierarchy towards the top. Places of the system or leverage points where having an effect can have or doing something about it can have the most impactful effect to change the system. On the lower end, you have the things that we typically do where you hear a problem, the next thing you do is make a quick solution, right? And I think to me, decolonizing global health, most of the topics and as the way we are talking about them cluster in that lower form where it almost looks like we are doing something. For example, we now have the discussions and NIH has led some of these discussions around, oh, we need to change authors, authorship. Authorship comes mainly from high income countries having the first and last. So what have people done? Now on NIH grants that are being done in the global space, you occasionally see names sprinkled across the authorship in a way that is almost like tokenism. Now you see 10, 10 last authors, just so that they can accommodate somebody from the global south to look like now the authorship is. So to me, those are low leverage points where I don't know that we are impacting the system uh, that much, but yet we do those things. What are the examples of what I would think of as high leverage points that we really need to go towards to really change the system, change even these terms that we are using, including the term decolonizing global health. I think, for example, you could think about from NIH perspective, for example, we are funding grants internationally and the indirects for international are capped at 8%. The only way you build an infrastructure at the US institutions, for example, I don't know of an institution that has less than 40% of indirect costs. That is where you get money to build the capacity to actually really do the research, right? And that is not happening. And yet we have not changed that from our systems at NIH. And yes, we are having those discussions. One that is latest from NIH that is really worrying the community out there, and again, are those low leverage points, was our reaction to what happened to COVID and China and all that story with the political whatever, where at, we now require that work done in the Global South in collaboration that NIH funds in the Global South, actually at some point, we asked that we wanted all the lab book, the records, every notes that was being put out there to be transferred to the global north in the name of you know, transparency and following research and things like that. 
we have since toned the language down a little bit by saying they should be accessible, right? The, even the level, that the same levels of those rules don't apply even here in the US itself. But it is a policy that is going to be applied. So I just want to say that even at NIH, we fund the science, right? We are the people giving money to people who are going to do this so-called global health. We have tilted it such that only 8% of indirect are spending in the global. We are part of the problem. We have contributed to that problem. And I think there's a humility that needs to come from our end to accept that and then work towards truly working towards higher leverage points to effect change. Sorry if I took too long. No, no um, and that was great. And you've you've touched on a lot of things, but I just want to ask a follow-up to uh, Dr. Amofoye, specifically about parachute research, right? So Dr. Laro um, spoke about the idea of what they're trying to do to combat parachute research, but you know he has pointed out that he thinks it's superficial. It's not enough. The response to parachute research should not be tokenism. Right. Really, what should we, you know? Yeah, the concept of parachute research, for those who are not aware of it, is this idea that someone like me, who's practicing predominantly in the West, could go and perform a research project um, at a different institution now, somewhere in the global South, which means I am almost 100% dependent on those in-country partners to do the data gathering, patient recruitment. I mean, they're running a lot of the day-to-day. -day. And then once the research results are out and we're ready to publish in a high-impact journal, um, I can go and publish that research and not give credit to any of my co-authors at all. Or even if when they get credit, or I should say my co-researchers, or even if they're getting credit, they're not getting credit in those important positions, right? The first author, the last author, the corresponding author. You may get one kind of, you know, co-researcher uh, sprinkled in there. And so, of course, parachute research has a lot of important sequelae. The people who are the first and the senior authors on these projects are the ones who can then accumulate more funding and they, they get, um, you know, the fame from the projects. Um, and so, now, several um, journals like The Lancet has says you cannot publish research predominantly performed in a different country than your home base and not have co-authors from the, that country. And so now there's tokenism or sometimes uh, what can be viewed as tokenism where people may just arbitrarily sprinkle names of co-authors in there. The reason why this can be dangerous is, of course, the, the concept of the project, the methodology, the implementation is driven by the person who had the funding from the West. And so we haven't actually asked the local experts, hey, if this is the problem, how would you solve it? So that they have that voice from the beginning in how the, the problem is even approached, how it's solved. And a lot of times when we do approach in-country partners, if they have full, um, I think, respect and confidence in our relationship, they'll say, that's not even going to work here at all. Scrap it. It's not even, this, this idea is, this is not the problem that we want to solve. We really would much rather focus on malaria. Forget this thing you're trying to do. So I think that parachute research, people understand on the surface that it is dangerous and it's exploitative. Um, and so there's a surface level solution, like Dr. Laura was saying, of saying, well, just put in more co-authors there. I think there are deeper solutions we can have, but they're more difficult. I think we can look to editorial boards and say, not just now having authors uh, being included in these journals, let's have experts from different countries as part of the editorial boards. Because now when the editorial board does a call for papers, now they're actually highlighting the area of concern of that country, of the in-country experts, right? And so those call for papers, that's actually where we then generate the ideas for future funding, right? If we have multinational boards for the professional organizations, I'm a radiologist, so I'm always going to think of radiology first. If we have multinational boards for these professional organizations, then you have multiple voices saying, you know, maybe this problem seems uh, from the Western perspective as the most important one to solve, but really living here acutely, this is probably where we should put our funding in. So it's really elevating the voice of the people who are doing the work every day. I have to, no matter how passionate I am about global health, how, how much I think it is 
you know, global health equity is, is, you know, my, my life's work. I have to be humble enough to admit that, you know, my eight to five is still, is still based here in the U S. And so giving every platform that we have to the experts, like Dr. Lara said, they're, they're considered the local experts, even though based on the topics we're considering, they're the global experts. They are the thought leaders um, so that they're the ones giving the keynote addresses, right? They're the ones saying, these are the problems we've seen so far. This is actually how you work towards global health equity. Um, and so the conversation still has to be generated from that side of the, of the world. Oh, thanks for sharing. Um, Dr. Noor, you know, as somebody who is a local expert, I guess, um, you know, how do you really balance that between, you know, obviously wanting funding from, you know, your colleagues in the West and trying to trying to set the, the, the direction for what the research should be, knowing that they might not be interested in that? And, you know, what are your general experiences and our thoughts? <laughs> as a local expert <laughs> um i mean i echo the thoughts of uh, both dr omofoye and uh, alaro um being in in ethiopia and in africa um i think that we should take ownership of the issues that we have so we are the ones who are facing the day to day and we are the ones who are seeing the problems that need to be tackled in a timely manner and as mentioned i think COVID-19 was a wake-up call for everybody. I mean, there was this probably underlying issue that everybody was thinking about, but we all know that we can't live like an island. Whatever happens here is going to happen there. So I think we have to take over the narrative and we have to try and convince partners that there are there should be a win-win in somewhere in between. Maybe do half the research of whatever the the narrative is, but then also take up some issues that are important for us that need to be addressed in a timely manner and try and push that agenda in different discussions and different forums and make that a, a topic to talk about all the time. And it's like what Dr. Alaro said. I mean, I don't hear about this conversation in our setup. I, I, it's the first time hearing about it. So clearly there is a conversation to be had. <laughs> so, so that's, I think, something to start with. But like I said, I wouldn't want to start talking about this with the term decolonizing global health. I don't, I, I'm, I don't like the term personally. I don't, um, I don't think it brings anything positive to, to the table, the word. And who came up with the word? I mean, from what I hear from the experts, <laughs> um, I don't know who came up with this, but it's a difficult term to talk about. Who's the colonizer? Who's decolonizing the colonizer or whatever is a, is a, a complex topic that you're arguing about the title, not even getting to the issue that we want to talk about. So I think we should start with the topic of saying equity and health should be a, a, something, a basic human right is health. Education is key for that. We have to educate, we have to retain our educated uh, uh, workforce. Uh, I think nations uh, in, in the South should worry about that and take things a step at a time and try and build on that. And I was talking to a colleague of mine who is um, working in global health and I wanted his perspective because he works a lot on that. And I called him and I said, hey, I'm doing this, this panel discussion and I wanted to know about this conversation. And he's, uh, he's like, oh yeah, that's been going on. But that's exactly what he said. Who the terminology by itself is is an issue, and I think we have to understand where it comes from. And so he suggested that I I watch this Netflix uh, video on it's called Bending the Arc. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know about it, but Paul, about Paul Farmer and and how it all started and all that. And I started it. I didn't finish it yet, but it was such an interesting beginning and to understand what global health is, where it comes from, what is the donor, the receiver, everything about that. And I think everybody should see that. I'm not promoting anything. I'm just saying that it was, it's a, it was a nice introduction to understanding the basics. So I think in the South, we first have to understand the concept. I think I don't uh, personally understand the whole um, um, vast complex nature of this topic. And I think it's important that we should start talking about the narrative and then bring that to the table when we talk about research, 
collaboration, need, um, and that's important. And I think we have to start with ourselves first and then bring that to the table. All right. Can I, um, Farouk, sorry, can I, um, I'm going to insert myself here uh, for a second. Even though it says it's Mohammed talking, his hands are talking. <laughs> We're just sharing a space. No, I, I want to, um, first, I, I want to acknowledge, like, it's so, so, powerful the um that uh, you all agree um on on the terminology and how the, even the terminology to start with is is uh obnoxious is is uh annoying um but but also to to acknowledge that or, or highlight and applaud that you move on from the conversation about terminology to okay what are we going to do about it because this is something that we're going to um move on pretty quickly I, I did uh, read it with the same interest and with the same um, annoyance, I guess, when you said decolonizing. But um, but the next step is like, well, there is a, a something to be said about neo-colonialism, where like having a power structure where you hold the money and you hold the technology, then you are trying to insert your control upon what you do, and uh, and and there was a. a, a, a I want to say it was Forbes um, magazine uh, article that described us that are from elsewhere, but work in the U.S. as double agents, and that was also, you know, borderline insulting, right? It's like why double agent? I'm not a spy. I'm not stealing anything from anyone. Um, but it was it was that um, similar encounter or, or choking feelings, right? Because you do feel like you're from somewhere, but you work somewhere else and you are working for both forces. So at the same time, that double agent sounds like an insult. <laughs> um, when you read the article, it sounded like a nice thing to be. It sounded like something that I wanted to be. Um, so um, I, I, I think that we're gonna have a lot of that, but I wanna highlight and appreciate that we move from the purely academic conversation of what term to use into how we translate it into something useful for both uh, us that are here but want to be somewhere else and those that are um, outside, let's say, the U.S. but, um, but want to participate in this bigger tent of advancing care. And, uh, and, and I think that um, at least for the people working in the U.S. or based in the U.S., it's just a, a call to be a little bit more humble. And it, to me, it became a little bit of a, of a checklist. Are you involved in anything that you wouldn't be proud of if you were on the other side? Like, um, you know, like, would I be proud of the same paper, of the same um, project if I was um, the person doing the work in Ethiopia or in Latin America? Um, and and, and that, having that checkpoint where you say like, well, I'm gonna check, it's not about authorship, it's more than that, it's like about like the actual benefits of research, it's actually about what are the benefits for the people that are doing the research as compared to me that I'm just kind of here analyzing the data or taking advantage of a structure that allows me to um, publish easier or something like that. And my, my last comment is to say that um, I also appreciate the comments about um, not being authorship only and moving from authorship to editorial board members, but also moving to reviewers. One of the problems that we have is that um, when we support uh, colleagues uh, writing their projects from um, outside the US, then it gets sent to expert reviewers that are US based. And then everything to them sounds like, well, I think it has been proven or, well, I don't think this is, uh, you know, how we practice here or like they come with a number of excuses to not accept the research, not because it's not well presented, not because it wasn't well conducted, but because they don't feel it's impactful to their practice. So aside from editors and authors, we also require everyone in the middle, including reviewers. Thanks. Uh... Thanks for your thoughts, uh, Hansel. And I'm I'm just gonna um, add to that and and to what um, Dr. Noor was saying. You know, there there are these double agents, right? There are these you know people in the diaspora, and you know I know Dr. Laro thinks we should be doing more people in the diaspora. What you know? What do you think our role should be? You know, I'm gonna leave this open to whoever wants to um, respond first. What do you think the role is of people in the diaspora? Um, 
And also, while you're answering that, what how big do you think the issue of brain drain is and um, sort of perpetuating these power imbalances between the global south and the global north? So brain drain and then so it, brain yeah. and drain, what should be done? Yeah, so to Dr. Otero's point uh, about we have to have these discussions before, because they are happening, right? And we need, our voices need to be heard. I agree, I agree with that. But I think just like we claim about the research agenda, for example, being controlled in the South by the North because of economic power, because of white supremacy and everything else, right? So is the conversation, right? Whatever, what, what we are talking about and where they want us to talk, I don't think is a place where they change. They are leading that conversation as well. Uh, this glo decolonizing global health reminds me of another term closely re related about cultural competency, where we came up with a term where it meant that, oh, now I just need, if I could just learn more Kenyan and uh, whatever, and fit. you can't be culturally competent in any culture. And it shouldn't be a goal. If anything, it's supposed to be cultural humility. But if because the discussion was taken to cultural competency, this, there are course, courses and classes that are being done at universities to teach people about cultural competency, to make them very competent in perpetuating the same things that we are complaining about, right? So I, I, I'll just leave that there for that, just as I thought that the, the conversation is shifted that we still end up talking about the things that are actually not relevant for the overall discussion of health, right? About diaspora. This is now the part I would actually like the decolonizing term to be used. And diaspora as, are ever so crucial. This conversation is not about the global South because I think for the global South to ever have a voice, it will be because they are putting their own monies into the agenda. Until that happens, this discussion is happening outside them. Whether they are conversing in it or whether they're involved, I don't care, right? How about us, the diaspora, who are treading both worlds, right? Because we are here now and we start by decolonizing our own minds. Like I said, the way I think, the, the schools I went to, what I was taught was success. Even this idea that we are talking about authorship, that being a last author is a big deal, is a standard set by this system. So when I'm involved in this conversation with that mind, for whom am I speaking, right? The, the idea of global brain drain, like you bring it up, is again an agenda that is set to me to think about it in one way where somebody leaves Africa, comes to the US, now it becomes a global drain. The work you're doing, Dr. Dako yourself, to me is probably more important and more expansive than the work you'd have done had you been stationed in Nigeria right now for Nigeria. So even that discussion in itself needs to be tilted on its head. We are, being, we are being groomed to think a certain way that I think doesn't serve the cause that we are fighting for. Decol help me decolonize my own mind. Help me not perpetuate the same thing. Because if I'm thinking last authorship is important and I go to Kenya now, I'm going to talk to Kenyans about how to become um, uh, last authors. Who does that serve? I'm, I'm perpetuating the same things because my mind, what su success for me was to become as powerful as I could be, become a god and people could celebrate me and say how important I am and all that. Why? Because that is what I was taught by those colonial systems. And that is what I thrive to. When you work in your laboratories, Farouk, you can give us your own example. How independent do you really feel as being an assistant professor at, at um, UPenn for you to get to full professorship, you have to tow a certain line that is already defined for you as you are having this discussion about decolonizing. Uh, it is ever so critical that the diaspora can twist this discussion a little bit, can help because you work here now, you can talk to NIH, you can ask us, why aren't we changing? 
the idea of, 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 of 8%. Why aren't we working on the review to make sure that every grant that comes in that is global has global people reviewing it, not just the so-called experts. We, the diaspora, who are here, who care about health, have to be in the conversation in a different way, but I'm afraid that the conversation we are engaging in is the one defined by the system that creates, that was created, that perpetuates the same thing that we think we are fighting. I just want to chime in, if, if I may. <laughs> um, I beg to differ with one uh, point that you made, uh, Dr. Uh, Alaro. Um, yes, the diaspora community does bring a lot to the table in terms of giving back to the continent. There's no doubt about it. A lot of people feel that they have the connection uh, with their home country and do a lot more uh, than, I mean, they, they have the drive and the initiative and, and the passion to do it. And that is absolutely necessary. And I understand that um, brain drain is a problem and we do have to talk about it because, for example, um, I mean, the USMLE, the ESFMG after 2024 is not gonna allow uh, foreign graduates to practice in the US unless they come from an accredited uh, school. And that's the deadline is the end of 2023. There is a lot of people who are uh, taking the, uh, the exams to, to uh, be able to uh, join residency program in the US and that's okay because as a nation, we are not providing the work that they there's no job opportunity, there's no job satisfaction, there are so many complicated issues, there's inflation. I understand the need for why people want to go. And that's okay, but we do still have to talk about it because these are our uh, educated people that we are losing as a nation. But I know that they will come back eventually or they will give back in some way, but, uh, you mentioned that Dr. Farouk is doing more for Nigeria being in UPenn than he would if he was in Nigeria. And I, I don't agree with that statement because I think he would have done just fine for Nigeria if he was in Nigeria <laughs> because right. he has the drive to do that. And I think it's important to understand that people who stayed behind in Ethiopia is not because we didn't want to or we didn't have the opportunity, it's because we chose to for whatever reason. It might be for family reasons, it might be for uh, whatever reason it may be. It doesn't matter what the reason is. But I think people who stayed behind are, are carrying a burden, <laughs> carrying a lot on their shoulders, financial struggles and all the things that we talked about. But the diaspora community brings a lot back to the continent, for sure. No, no, no doubt about it. I'm not going to argue that point because that's important that the educated give back to the nation wherever right. it so dr. Can, Lawson, I, can i can i just you can respond I, uh, briefly and then we're going to go to dr um Mofoy, yes, I, I, see, I, see, I see i want to make sure that i'm very clear what i'm not saying is that the smart people the trained people leaving africa leaving uh, the south going to the north does not cause a problem for the south that is not what i'm saying if anything i think the system is created the education system that we've created is such that we are training people we are training a labor for the west that is why they fit the education system that you are dean of now at ethiopia right now that system is in large part training people for the West. The kind of training I went to at Egerton University, most of the things I was being taught about in chemistry, I never saw them until I came to the West to see them and I was able to apply them. So I'm not saying that there's no problem of brain drain. What I am saying is that we need to have a different discussion that like you mentioned, people live for different reasons. Human migration is not going to be stopped. It is going to happen. Unfortunately, because of the systems that have been implemented, it is such that that human migration for the, especially the so-called, um, the, 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 brain, the brain itself is migrating out of Africa. 
It's going to continue happening until Africa, for example, becomes able to sustain its own population. What I am saying now is that for us who have left, who are now here, who have a voice here, is the other part you said is you can't claim to want to be global, but also say I can only be global and be helpful to Kenya if I am in Kenya. There is such a big deal of the people who are brave enough to work in the conditions that they are working in for the reasons that they have to do back home. We don't have to create a barrier where we now get into a fight of, I'm, I've been told more than once that, oh, we trained you here and then you left and went to the US. You, you ran away from us, right? That is a perception. That, and then we end up fighting each other. Wrong conversation. The conversation's agenda is already set for us. The question for us, me as a diaspora, I am asking, now that I am here, now that I know the system, is there a way that I can look into my mind and not perpetuate the same things that they are continuing? The researchers like ourselves who are going back home are doing the same thing that we are complaining about these other folks doing. So that is what I'm talking about, that I can be more useful regardless of where I am. I could be in Kenya now, or I am here. Now I am here where the money is coming, right? Money for research is coming from the high-income countries. What conversation should I need to have? to really change, reverse that brain drain, regardless of where I'm located, I guess is a point I'm trying to make. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great response. Toma. This is, this is like a, this is a three hour conversation we're trying to have in one hour. And I'm, I'm so jealous. I have to figure out how to have you all over to dinner and we can, we can continue this. First, I wanted to provide some context for those who may not know. A lot of the reason that brain drain occurred to begin with is because of systems, colonialist systems, right? At a time when, you know, the world war was over and global powers were deciding to fund research and fund uh, health in the global South, they put a lot of constraints on that funding, including salaries. And so if you artificially suppress salaries in order to meet these funding um, criteria from abroad, now suddenly people who were compensated fairly are being compensated at much lower rates. And then simultaneously, a lot of those global powers began recruiting healthcare workers to go abroad to work. So yes, there are individual decisions being made, but there are also decisions that were made generations ago that put the system into place. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I really love Dr. Olaro's statement around the mindset of, okay, we're here now. Now what do we do, right? Um, I'll say I, for one, have been trying to get a term to catch on that I'm calling brain gain. That's the term I'm trying to get to catch on, okay? This idea that, yes, for some of us in the diaspora, we fully intend for our careers to straddle multiple nations, at this point, even if I try to get up and say, I'm going to move to one of the countries I'm working in, which one? I give lectures, you know, weekly in Tanzania. I do it virtually by 6 a.m. my time. Am I going to move there? Or is it to Zambia where I do, you know, lectures at noon on a different day? Or is it going to be to, to, to Nigeria or the work in the Caribbean? Where would I even move? At, this, at some point, it's just global health. And wherever you are, how do you then contribute from there? Um, I think that what's actually the second point to that is that brain gain is not just dependent on diasporans. Diasporans and the in-country experts, we did not single-handedly get us to this point of inequity in global health. It's everybody's problem, right? So brain gain is something that every one of us can look at and say, whether I was originally born in a high-income country or I was born somewhere else, today, how can I help to contribute to brain gain in places outside of my local environment? Thank you. So, you know, this has been a uh, amazing conversation. I'm, I've learned so much, you know, um, but I want to, you know, switch gears a little bit and I'm going to start with Dr. Alaro. And we've talked about some of this, but, you know, we're here now, like you said, um, what should we do moving forward, right? So like what, you know, when you go to Kenya, you're interacting with folks in the global South or diaspora or or your allies, you know, in NIH or your enemies, what 
you know, what, you know, what agenda should we be pushing forward? Like, what are specific strategies that we should be um, working together on? So the <laughs> you set me up, man. You set me up. <laughs> so, so I, I think I think one one very important area that we can think about is equity in research collaboration. As long as the monies are going to be coming from the West, and I think in my lifetime, that is going to be the case. I would have said we will strike gold in Africa and things will just change. We have done that. And that gold is not helping us, right? So as long as we are still doing the research and the money is coming from outside, I think the way to try to get towards equity is to really look into the research collaborations and what I can explore my um, diasporan colleagues who are doing research in Africa or in any other LMIC, be it um, Latin America or elsewhere, is can you strive to set an example of what you think would be good? If you were applying for a grant, I was amazed that some of the, even the MPI, you know, and, uh, a senior investigator from an LMIC being on a grant that is funded by an NIH, the grant was written and they never got to see the budget. They don't know what the budget looked like. So all they are dependent on is their USPI telling them we will give you 10,000 out of this 5 million to do us this X, Y, Z, right? And that, that is wrong, but they, would have, they don't even know how to complain because they don't know the budget. So can we strive to set an example? Can you try to make sure that everybody that is in your team sees the grant you're writing, sees the budget, that you include everybody that is doing that research on the ground in, you pay their salaries. You know, people tell me, oh, you know what? Doing research in Africa is cheap. You know, 50,000 take you a long way. And I said, you're right about that. But the problem with that is that that person uh, you're paying 50000 to collect samples. All that money is going to the samples, and they're also selling their good to make sure that that work works. So you are not compensating them for their time. They are actually, you leave them broker than they were before you left. So I think that is important. And in, while you are doing that, you can think about how to change and start empowering that research to really come from the locals, driving from your own backgrounds and what you know about the, the context where you are going to work. That is key. The second piece that I think is key is why have we made research all about money? Why is the power only defined by the money? If you did not have patience, right? Where are you going to do your work? Why is money being made the most important thing? Again, is an agenda driven by other people where only emphasis is given to money. Can we, the diaspora, can you, the people doing this research, help our continent change that? The, the one thing I consistently will see is WHO or everybody else citing the WHO numbers about Africa. Oh, in the next 20 years, 70% of all cervical cancer will be in Africa, right? I believe actually that the next big thing will be done on those patients to get the next big thing in cancer. Unfortunately, we might not be even be in front of that agenda. Could we help our continent, help LMICs more broadly, help the South more broadly to tilt that discussion to be, I'm coming to the table and you know what I'm bringing? I may not have all those, that money. I may not have all the skills. I may not have, all the research questions, but you know what I have? I have patience that you need for your science. You bring the money and the techniques and everything else you're bringing and will give you patience and our own local knowledge. I think this was, uh, Dr. Mofoy mentioned this. Lived experiences, it doesn't have to even have been written anywhere. I don't like the idea. Do you know how many journals, for example, we have in Africa that are not indexed in PubMed and therefore are considered useless? Do you know where our high income colleagues go to scour for their data for what they want to do next in those, those so-called non-index journals, right? We, 
diaspora are in a position where we can be on the table here to change that arc. I think there's somebody shared about something about changing an arc. We can be in those discussions here, and I think there's a role for us to play towards the brain game that was being referred to earlier. Thank you so much. Dr. Noor, solutions from a global South standpoint, you know, what do you want to tell the trainees that are here today um, as far as their, their uh, mindset um, moving forward? And, you know, like what are some tangible solutions that you have to solve um, some of these pressing problems? I think we should first start talking about the problem before trying to find the solution, because clearly we need to have a conversation. And I think, um, I think it's been an eye-opening conversation for me. Uh, and, and I think um, there's something there that needs to be talked about, um, but who's gonna have the narrative and who's gonna have the, the, the guts and the oomph to do it <laughs> is one thing. So um, I think discussing about it first, I don't think solution is where we are right now. I think we're not talking about the problem yet. So um, bring the conversation to the table. Um, you guys are all welcome. My neighbor, Dr. Alaro, <laughs> next time you're in Kenya, <laughs> pass through Ethiopia. <laughs> and it is a conversation to have. And I think that's where we should start first. And I think we are nowhere near talking about solutions right now. Thank you. You, you make a great point if I may interject quickly. And I think, I think the conversation can be begun. And Dr. No, I think one thing you can do in the space that you are, I, I strongly believe it is in the next generation. I, I think it's even past my time now that at least as you train the next generation, as you instill in them, let us not wait until they get where we are to be decolonizing their minds. So I think that is something we can do more immediately because it is in that generation, they are impatient, they are hungry, they are asking questions that we were not able to ask in my time. So I, I, I applaud you for your work, but it is there that I think the change begins. Okay, I'm off okay. <laughs> um, Just general thoughts about solutions. I, I know this is a difficult question to, uh, to, to answer, it, but- um, It is, it is. But I, I want to applaud um, UPenn, but you know, the Center for Global Health, Penn Radiology, CHOP, I mean, this is a brave, difficult and complex conversations. And these are the kinds of conversations that don't frequently happen in academia or happen openly in this way. And so I have to applaud all of you who planned this um, for bringing this to the forefront. So thank you for that. I think that's the first thing, like Dr. Noel was saying, is having the conversations. Um, I also like the point that was made that when we're having the conversations, we should not stick to the Western idea of success to determine who should be at the table. So it's not just who has the most money, the most funding, the most um, titles, uh, the most degrees. It's also the people who you know have been in that community for 30 years running a you know single room clinic <laughs> but they, they, they delivered every single child in that village for the last 40 years, right? Like they have, I mean, we know them. Like, it, and it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I was born to phys physician parents. My mom was one of those people, right? Um, and her name's not published in journals, but if you go into the marketplace with her, it's like you walked in with, you know, a celebrity, right? Um, so I think that that's part of what we have to think is like broaden the definition of success so we have the right people at the table. I think that part of we, what we can do, Dr. Laura really inspired me today, as the people who are here, every platform that we have, do we question who else we're bringing with us to the table? One thing that's been, I hope, a part of my career is that whenever I've had the opportunity, I've thought, whose voice can I amplify here? And frequently it's been trainees. Can I bring a trainee onto this project? And can I, um, and then when I have an opportunity to say, okay, what thought leader are people just unaware of that really needs to provide the perspective from their own country, from their own experience um, onto this platform? So I think that's part of what's so important about what Penn is doing here today is saying, we're bringing people who have really extensive lived experience from different parts of the world to contribute to a conversation that they typically wouldn't be asked about in public, you know? Um, so I think that what we do is give platforms. And then there was a comment in the, in the chat, in the Q&A, where someone was asking, should we rethink where we submit our, our um, research articles to? And I think that's a great question. Should we rethink that? Should we start to submit to journals uh, that may not be based in the North. 
Should we, when we do uh, call for papers from these journals, try to match journals from the North with journals from the South so that you have paired editorial boards, paired reviewers, paired you know, um, writers and researchers that now can bring truly a global, a transnational perspective to these questions that are being asked, to the questions that are being answered. I think that there is a lot of room to, you know, people th talk a lot about paying attention, paying attention. I want people to pay attention to me. No, no, let's give attention. How can we be really passionate about giving attention, putting the spotlight um, on some of the places that have unfortunately um, not had that attention. Oh, thank you so much. We're, we're coming to the end, but um, we're going to let Dr. Alaro um, uh, respond because he has done a lot of inspiring today. So yeah, I don't want to stop it. And I'm sorry, again, Dr. Mofoy, I know are inspiring me here and to whatever, getting into trouble, right? But 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 I think I think I'm latching onto something from the conversation that is being had. One is Dr. Noah said, "Why are we talking about the solutions? We've not talked about the problem." But yet, Dr. Mofo has just latched onto something here by saying, "Why don't we talk about the future?" Right? Again, they want us to focus on talking about the problem. You are talking about the problems of our fathers, right? The, the, the journal authorship and all those things are the problems of our parents. We are going to spend our entire lives talking about those. By the time we realize we need change, it's too late. So I really propose to the young minds here, don't be bogged down by the problems that we've created for you. Those are our problems. Don't solve them. Project yourself into the future. I, I can use it, actually, if you can look it up, there's a methodology called backcasting, right? Project yourself into the future. Create the future. The future is not there to be predicted, as some Africans said. It is there to be built, right? Let us project ourselves into envision a future of the good that we want, the kind of science that we want, the kind of control that you'd want to be, and then walk backwards and say, from where I am now, how do I make these little steps moving towards that future? So I really like this idea that maybe maybe the part of control here is that we get bogged down too much in discussing the problems that have been created for us instead of envisioning a future. Go to the moon. Even if you don't have the tools now, then work your way backwards and say, how do we get there? Instead of solving the problems that we've created for you. Wow. Amazing panel. Um, we're gonna take this conversation in person soon. We just need to pick a location. Um, I believe we have to go back to our regular schedule, right Hansel? Um, yeah. Thank you so much panelists. Feel free to hang out for a little bit. I'm pretty sure people are gonna have questions for you guys, but in the Meantime, I'm going to take it back to Mohammed to show us the rest of the 10 cases. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. It's an honor. I, I learned a lot. Thank you for the invitation. Th Folks. Thank you, guys. I think that to quote uh, an American politician, this is the definition of creating good trouble, or at, at least I hope this is the definition. Um, Yep, we're going to continue uh, back to our cases. Uh, remember that happening is um, voting is going to be happening at the end. Remember that we have uh, some cash prices to distribute today. And um, again, as we move from the conversation, let's welcome um, back Mohammed to present the rest of the cases. Okay, thank you once again for the panelists for such an inspiring and powerful conversation where they touched on a sensitive topic. So uh, as Dr. Hansen <clears throat> was reminding us that uh, we're going to be continuing our cases, we still have 10 more cases to show. And by the end of these 10 cases, we'll be having a poll for the attendees to choose their favorite uh, case, which will be our People's Choice, uh, which, which will receive our People's Choice Award. So moving on to our 11th interesting case, Dr. Um, Kebed de Kefir Sadiq will be presenting uh, a case titled Cyst or an Aneurysm. The role of color flow Doppler mode uh, from Liberia and from John F. Kennedy Hospital. So. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Kabadego Fagabasadek from John F. Kennedy Hospital in Monrovia, Liberia. My mentor is Dr. Abebe Tegin Demisei. Uh, we are so uh, grateful for the organizers for creating this kind of educative platform where we can uh, share knowledge, experience, and where we can make connections. So uh, I'll be discussing the role of color flow Doppler mode in the diagnosis of cystic structures, and we'll be discussing uh, two cases. And we don't have uh, uh, any disclosure. So our first case is a 20 years old uh, male patient who presented with malignant hypertension, which was difficult to control with medical management. He was on chronic medical follow-up for the last five years. On echocardiography, he had left ventricular hypertrophy. And so he was sent for routine abdominal ultrasound scan to our department. And on ultrasound, he had this large cystic structure measuring five centimeter by four centimeter in the region of the left upper pole of the kidney and extending into the splenic, uh, splenorenal fossa. So with this grayscale ultrasound, as everybody thinks, the first differential that comes to someone's mind is a simple kidney cyst. And uh, because of its location, uh, someone may also consider cysts arising from the adrenal, adrenal gland or just a sim, uh, cystic pheochromocytoma can also be uh, a possible differential diagnosis. So um, those were the differential diagnoses which were uh, entertained in our mind, but because of his age and underlying hypertension he had, uh, something just pushed me to throw color flow Doppler into, into the field. And when we apply color flow Doppler mode, this was very amazing. He, he had a big aneurysm arising from the left main renal artery uh, with a classic uh, Pepsi or yin yang sign. So, uh, a diagnosis of left renal artery aneurysm was made, and uh, that has significantly changed the subsequent patient management protocol. And this patient was uh, subsequently managed with left nephrectomy because we don't have other endovascular interventions. So the, whenever you encounter cystic structure, especially in uh, working uh, of um, secondary hypertension. If you see a cystic structure in the region in the kidney or uh, in the region of kidney, please don't forget throwing color flow Doppler mode into or into that cystic structure. You know, like applying that mode doesn't take more than five seconds of our scan, of our total scan. So please don't uh, don't hesitate throwing color flow Doppler mode. Uh, you'll significantly change the management of the patient. So our second patient was a 34 years old patient who was referred from trauma unit after he sustained a uh, road traffic accident three weeks before his uh, his presentation. So he he, he came with a progressive uh, proximal tie and gluteal region swelling. So on ultrasound, as you see, he had collection deep within the muscle tissue. And uh, we saw this uh, well-defined and unequoic cystic structure deep within the muscle measuring around four centimeters. So we applied colorful Doppler and that was a big aneurysm. And uh, with a detailed scan, it is uh, aneurysm arising from the inferior gluteal artery. and uh, uh, this pseudo aneurysm was ruptured and it was causing hematoma in his thigh. So uh, the diagnosis of post-traumatic pseudo aneurysm was made and uh, surgical ligation of that aneurysm was done. So the take home message is don't diagnose simple cyst from head to toe without applying color flow Doppler mode because blood vessel is everywhere. You may find aneurysm in the brain in the neck and head, 
everywhere in our body so please just apply color flow doppler mode before you diagnose simple cyst because by making that you will make very important diagnosis which will change the patient management and also uh, most importantly uh, when those kind of aneurysms are in superficial structures you will avoid risky procedures like puncture especially when we are working in resource limited area like in africa where uh, where things are very difficult uh, where arteriograms are not available where ct and other modalities are not available just use this simple mode which doesn't cost anything and which is not time consuming so please don't forget applying color flow doppler mode on cystic structures before making the diagnosis of simple cyst That was an that was an interesting uh, case uh, from Liberia. Um, interesting case, interesting images. So now moving on to our twelfth case, a uh, case of a foreign body aspiration presented by Dr. Naomi Rono from Kenya, uh, from Tenwex Hospital. Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. My name is Dr. Naomi Rono from Tenwek Hospital and I work under the pediatric department. I'll be presenting on an unexpected presentation of foreign body aspiration under the mentorship of Dr. Clarksleep and Michael P. Hatton. I'll go through uh, introduction, case presentation, discussion and conclusion. Uh, tracheobronchial foreign body aspiration is a potentially life-threatening event and the most common and is the most common cause of morbidity and mortality in children with peak incidence between age one and two. In some cases, presentation may be subtle, although in most of the cases the presentation is usually acute. Uh, in early this year, we had a patient who presented with a um, nine-month history of a chronic productive cough and had associated to disputum, night sweats, weight loss, and fevers. He had been to several facilities for management of the same symptoms with a couple of antibiotics and had also been evaluated for pulmonary tuberculosis and all his, his tests were negative and had come in to our facility for review and further workup. His examination was basically unremarkable. He was not in respiratory distress. His vitals were okay, apart from a temperature of 37.7, .7, had a normal risk rate of 22 and was saturating okay at 97% room air. His systemic exam was remarkable for reduced air entry with crack holes in the left lower lung field. His lab investigations were otherwise okay. Uh, based on these findings, we did a chest X-ray shown in the picture on the screen as a bullet shaped uh, object in his left bronchus. The next, uh, based on the chest X ray findings, we, he, we elected to do a chest CT scan that showed a more clear image of the bullet shaped object on his left bronchus. The following slides are images of his chest CT. Uh, the last slide is on coronal view of his chest CT. A CT scan from an off-site uh, reporting center showed a high density foreign body that was bullet shaped, that was impacted at the bifurcation of the lower and upper lobe bronchi, had also associated complete atelectasis and consolidation of the left lower lobe with extensive air bronchograms. And based on this, the patient went in for urgent bronchoscopy with intra-op findings of a left bronchus uh, foreign body. Uh, pencil tip rubber with its metallic frame and had minimal pass around that site. He, however, had an unremarkable post-operative recovery. 
The image on the screen is the gross specimen of the foreign body. As you can see, it's an eraser head from a pencil. This is in relation to his chest uh, CT images. Children under five are particularly considered more susceptible to foreign body aspiration and usually have objects such as groundnuts, beans, although they can have inorganic objects such as uh, toys. Uh, there is preferential lodgement of foreign bodies in the right bronchus more than the left, although left lodgement is also can also occur. Most of these patients present with partial air obstruction with strider, tachypnea, and hoof, although in some cases they have complete obstruction and present in severe respiratory distress with altered mentation. There are cases of delayed diagnosis that, con that can occur as a result of factors such as unwitnessed aspiration and misinterpretation of symptoms. Uh, given this, from this presentation, we learned that it's important, uh, chest X-ray is, is an important diagnostic worker for a chronic cough and also the role of e-health in low resource setting. For example, in our setup, we have no on-site radiologist, but we mainly rely on an off-site team for the radiologic uh, image interpretation, and this has been working well so far. These, these are my references. And thank you for your audience during this presentation. Another interesting case from Kenya. Uh, now moving on to our 13th presentation today from Ethiopia, Dr. Michael Teklehaimon will be presenting a case of bilateral congenital lobar overinflation. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Tukhanmanu. I'm one of the subject radiology residents in our Southern University Department of Radiology. And Dr. Samuel Sisa is my mentor, and we're going to present a case of bilateral uh, congenital lower over inflation with prominent appearing parenchymal vascularity. Our case is a 10 days old transfusion unit uh, who presented with fast breathing and grunting since birth. She was born at an outside institution after a severe infection for an indication of severe polycarbonate And initial assessment was early onset neonatal surgery, for which she was treated with the nine days course of IVM Pcdin and Gentamicin, but she, she did not improve and she was subsequently transferred to our center. On presentation, the baby was desaturated and post vaccination showed um, specified percent. On four liters of intranasal oxygen, she was also tachycardic and tachypnic, and anthropometry was unaffected. Just the examination showed subcostal and intercostal retrophins. She decreased air in three in both lower lungs, but the cardiac examination was normal, and the uh, CVC was significant for raised uh, neutrophil uh, proportions. And given her severe symptoms, she was immediately admitted to our neonatal intensive care unit and the initial superintendent radiograph was done which showed uh, uh, an ill-defined infected of the right upper lung with bi-basal triangular lung opacities with sharp superior margins as we see here consistent with lower lung collapses and later hyperlucency especially of the right middle lung region which was presumed to be due to overinflation uh, related to the right upper lung process. So that was the initial assessment, a case of, a case of pneumonia with uh, overinflation of the right middle lung region and possibly of the left lung too, with uh, uh, by basal lung collapse, likely due to uh, excess airway secretions as the patient was on intranasal oxygen and was in severe respiratory distress. But bilateral congenital lobar overinflation was uh, suggested from the beginning, but it was not considered initially, given the reality of the condition. And uh, the level of vascularity we see 
his uh, hyperbolic influence was uh, deemed to be excess for congenital lower over inflation. But in our hospital, uh, supportive care continued together with septic doses of IV antisilin and cefepine, but the patient's clinical condition did not improve. Uh, two days into our uh, admission, uh, an uncontrast setting with multiple medical construction was done. So on the coronal section, uh, a more posterior image shows uh, marked that hyperinflation of the right middle lung and the left upper lung region together with uh, atelectasis with patchy regions of consolidation of the bilateral lower uh, lobes and on a more anterior section we can better see uh, a region of consolidation with atelectasis involving the right upper lung region and uh, within the hyperlucent hyper and overinflated uh, lobes, we see prominent upgrading vascularity. This is uh, shown by the ROC, uh, the level of vascularity in the hyperinflated uh, lobes uh, is clearly seen and they appear uh, in excess for uh, hyperinflated uh, lobes. And on axial images, we can better uh, again appreciate uh, uh, parts of consolidation in the collapsed bilateral lower lobes. So, also the level of vasculature in the affected lobes was relatively excess, I and mean, bilateral congenital lower inflation uh, was strongly considered at this time when uh, we consider the uh, hyperinflated appearance of the lobes with their associated mass effects and the deteriorating clinical condition of the patient. And uh, subsequently, uh, the baby underwent bilateral open posterior lateral thoracotomy, and this confirms the diagnosis intraoperatively. Uh, hyperinflated lobes, which are native to the surgical incisions, were noted, and contrast basal lungs were also found. These were typical findings for their low intraoperative and subsequently patients had smooth post-operative course in the pediatric ICU and later on in our general ward and she was discharged in stable conditions. So CLO is one of the very recognized congenital pulmonary conditions and uh, in half of the cases uh, causes unidentified but in another half uh, suggested mechanisms include bronchial cartilage dysplasia and um, in utero compression by apparent vessels. So, a rare condition occurring one in 70,000 to 90,000 newborns and usually affects the left upper lobe and the right middle lobe in this order. And uh, bilaterality is even more uh, rare. And fewer than 20 cases were reported from 1963 to 2021. And, uh, the cardinal imaging features that we saw in our case were overinflated lobe or lobes in uh, bilateral multiple cases. And this is reflected by hyperlucency and when severe by herniation with medicinal shift. And we can expect uh, uh, mass effects on neighboring lobes. And again, when severe on the contralateral lung and the decreased vas vasculature within the involved lobes is. Uh, is uh, common and uh, uh, associated with the condition. So I just brought uh, another companion case just to show the level of vascularity we can expect in uh, congenital lower overinflation. This is a confirmed case uh, involving the left upper lobe. In this form, it's all female infant. We can see the mass effect in the left lower lobe, and we can uh, better appreciate uh, the level of the uh, decreased vascularity and space uh, in the affected lobes. This is what we uh, expect typically in cases of severe lobe. So diagnosis can be confounded by common mimickers and uh, initially its uh, diagnosis requires a high index of suspicion. Hyperlucency, especially on just X-rays, uh, before HSCT confirms it. It can mimic uh, pneumothorax and uh, even uh, uh, cases of chest tube insertions uh, are reported and uh, 
another common mimicry is pneumonia, uh, just uh, as in our case, and on early radiographs, physiologic good retention can hide most of the typical imaging features. And uh, generally, what is uh, recommended uh, in one article is uh, to rely more on follow up radiographs for the appreciation of decreased pulmonary vessels. But uh, overall, uh, chastity must be done. It's a primary tool for the wholesome assessment of congenital lobar overinflation due to its higher resolution and multiple deformatic uh, abilities. So the main uh, take home messages are uh, that bilateral CO2 is especially rare in this high clinical suspicion, mainly in resource limited settings where uh, CTs in, may, might not be readily available. And this is required in early diagnostic for campaign treatment. The interest is mandatory to confirm suspicion and pull out common mimickers. And uh, uh, major point in our case is assessment of the status of pulmonary vasculature needs to be carried out in correlation with other cardinal imaging features and overall clinical force. And uh, once the diagnosis is made, our surgical intervention is life saving. And these are my references. And thank you. A very thorough uh, explanation from Dr. Mikhail for this case uh, from diagnosis to management. That was very interesting. Now, moving on to our 14th presentation from Botswana, Dr. Awone D. Tirwa will be presenting a case of an anomalous left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. Greetings to you all. I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to present today. My name is Dr. Aune Ditira. I'm a second year postgraduate student with the University of Botswana, pursuing my master's in pediatrics and adolescent health. And I'm stationed at Princess Marina Hospital, which is a government referral facility in Khaborone, Botswana. I'll be sharing a very unique case of an atypical late presentation of anomalous left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery, otherwise known as Alcapa, in a 13-month-old female. And my mentor for this was Prof. Endel Tafera, who's our in-house pediatric cardiologist. As mentioned, it's an acronym. Essentially, you have your left um, myocardium being perfused at low pressures, but also by deoxygenated blood, which is further imposed by what we call a coronary steel, where the right coronary artery takes the little blood that the left coronary artery has through um, collaterals. It's also called bland white garland syndrome, which is named after its first describers in the 1930s. It's a very serious but rare congenital cardiac anomaly affecting one in 300,000 live births. In Botswana to date, we've had four recorded cases diagnosed by our pediatric cardiologist. The, incident, um, the incidence does not vary geographically and there's no known racial predilection noted so far. It's, noted, it's associated with a 90% mortality rate within the first year of life. And in resource limited settings like Botswana, diagnosing Alcapa can be even more challenging due to various factors, including a limited number of cardiologists and restricted access to specialized diagnostic tools like your coronary angiography. My rationale for just bringing this case to the floor today was number one, to showcase the diagnostic challenges of an atypical Alcapa presentation. Two, and very importantly, to emphasize the paradoxical role of a simple anterior posterior chest X-ray as a valuable initial diagnostic clue. Thirdly, to highlight the importance of using approaches. I'm sure you've all heard about an approach to a floppy infant, an approach to a large silent heart in pediatric medicine, especially in resource limited settings where we can where it can help us to build comprehensive differentials in complex pediatric cases. And lastly, to illustrate the potential impact of early diagnosis on patient outcomes and treatment strategies. So just coming into the case, um, this is of a 13 month female who was HIV negative and um, reportedly previously well child, then came in with a two day history of shortness of breath, irritability, poor appetite, sweating excessively during feeds, no cough otherwise, 
no subjective fevers were reported, no signs of like upper respiratory tract infections, no known TB contact, no skin rashes. Only on probing, mom did mention that this baby hasn't been gaining weight too well for the past four months. Otherwise, this was the first time they were being seen ever by a doctor. Grossly unremarkable birth history. And clinically, this was an acutely ill child who was moderately, moderately to severely distressed, excuse me, with um, features of congestive heart failure and was also in cardiogenic shock. And very interestingly, interestingly didn't have any cardiac murmurs. So essentially, we didn't have any clinical features of infection. Our hematological studies were normal. We did get an X-ray, a chest X-ray, and I hope it projects well um, on figure one. Essentially, you can see that gross heart to miss cardiomegaly involving mainly the ventricles and the right atrium. And there was also some perihilar alveolar opacification, especially on the right, as, as well as a left pleural effusion. And then there was a positive syllabus silhouette sign at the right cardiac border indicating right middle lobe consolidation and these findings were due to we were thinking pulmonary edema um, infection not so much because we didn't really have any other markers for sepsis then we also did an ecg which is shown there and it demonstrates mainly septal and anterolateral ischemic changes and so we had this child who had a massive heart and x-ray, didn't have any murmurs, but was failing and was now in cardiogenic shock. And we started to think we need to approach this using our approach to a large silent heart. Our differentials at this point was, could this be a cardiomyopathy, a myocarditis, a mitral valve disorders? But we did think because we have ischemia and we have that massive heart and chest x-ray, could we be dealing with Alcapa? We went ahead and did an echo which showed us left ventricular dysfunction with an ejection fraction of 24%. We had dilated right coronary artery with normal origin, and then we had, it, we had our anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the main pulmonary artery. And if you can just look on the image I've put on my right, which is the left of the screen, you can actually see that blue flow, that retrograde flow coming from the main pulmonary artery, and that's actually our left coronary artery arising from the main pulmonary artery. So although the echo had really given us what we needed in terms of um, a definitive diagno diagnosis, we just went ahead and did a CT angio just to sort of kind of understand our pathology in greater depth, especially ah ahead of what would um, then be referred as a surgical case. So we actually have our um, CT angiogram image um, on the right, on my right and the left of the screen, and we can see an anterior posterior aortic angiogram with a catheter in the ascending aorta and only the right coronary artery actually fills up with contrast and this is diagnostic of al kappa because you can't actually visualize the left coronary artery and again on this image you can actually appreciate um, the overt cardiomegaly unfortunately we lost the child six months post intervention and this was due to the extensive myocardial compromise and the failure of the left ventricle to ever uh, re recover function and you will notice that this was quite a late presentation and so the repercussions were quite significant just some recommendations and take home take home thought points not only for the audience really but for me especially practicing in botswana where you know we do have um resource limitations some of the things that we can sort of think about instilling, and I've sort of broadened that out to say, we need to foster collaboration between different medical fraternities, such as cardiology and radiology, and even pediatrics to encourage information sharing and collective decision-making in complex cases. And more importantly, to be involved in research and data collection, data sharing, which in essence is what we're doing today on this forum. Thank you so much for your attention. That was an interesting case using multiple modalities. Uh, moving on to our 15th case, we're almost halfway uh, through the next set of cases. We have a case from Dr. Hilda Makungu from Tanzania, Mohimbli University of Health and Allied Sciences, discussing a clover leaf skull. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Hilda Makungu. I am a first year neurology fellow from Himbili University of Health and Allied Science in Tanzania. And I'm going to present to you a case of a clover leaf skull. So our patient was a two month old baby girl. Uh, she was a referral case and she came to us with a chief complaint of abnormal shape of the head that was not a birth. The patient was the only sibling that was born by non-consanguineous parents. 
The father was 25 years and the mother was 17 years. There was no known exposing factors. HIV and VDRL test was negative. Uh, the patient was born at 10. She was delivered by cesarean section due to obstructed labor. The best weight was 3.4 kilogram and she had a low upgrade score. On examination, there was abnormal shape of the head, also known as a cocephaly. And on examination of both feet, there was multiple digits and there was a partial fusion between digit 3 and digit 4, also known as a partial uh, syndactyl. So the patient went on and uh, doing the uh, brain MRI. So we have a coronal T2 weighted images of the brain. And uh, as you can see, there is abnormal shape of the skull, also known as a clover leaf. And there was marked dilatation of the lateral and third ventricle. The fourth ventricle was no. So there was a obstructive or the cephalus with obstruction that was not a distal to the third ventricle. And the dilatation was more noted on the temporal one. In addition, there was the uh, absence of uh, septum pellucidum. And however, as you can see on the next uh, actual T2 weighted images of the brain, the uh, optic chiasma was present. The, uh, there was also a shallow orbit that was noted, as you can see on this uh, MRI image. Furthermore, there was crowding of the posterior fossa structure with tonsillar herniation that was noted in this uh, T1 weighted sagittal MRI image. So the patient went on and doing other uh, examination. So the echo reveals small VSD and SD. So we had an impression of the clover leaf skull with associated brain malformation, as I've mentioned before. And based on an examination, there was also polydactyl and syndactyl. So we had four differential consideration, the Capitan syndrome, FIFA syndrome type 2, upper syndrome, and Cousin syndrome. However, we think this patient is more likely to have a Capitan syndrome because in FIFA syndrome type 2, they usually rarely present with polydactyl. And on a past syndrome, Cousin syndrome, they usually present with a severe form of syndactyl, but our patient had a partial syndactyl. So the patient went on uh, to do, uh, uh, they went on uh, for the treatment uh, and they did endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, they were trying to release the endocephalus and they, she was planned for Calvary of vote the in three months. Genetic testing was not done because it was not available in our setting. And uh, on three months follow-up, uh, the patient came up and we did an MRI. There was no change in endocephalus. And unfortunately, when the patient was still in the ward, she developed cardiac arrhythmia and passed away. So on discussion, clover leaf skull is a severe form of craniosynostosis. It is very rare, and uh, so far uh, there are less than 130 cases uh, that have been reported. And uh, it's usually a result of intrauterine premature closure of the coronal sagittal and lambdoid suture. And as a result of premature uh, fusion, and there is a bulge of the cranial contents in the superior aspect. And uh, as a result, there is characteristic uh, formation of the skull, also known as clover leaf skull. So clover leaf skull with syndactyl and polydactyl usually are associated with the four syndrome, the capital syndrome, apart syndrome, Cousin syndrome and FEFA syndrome type 2. So what we learn from this patient is a uh, clover leaf skull is usually associated with multiple malformation syndrome, including the cardiac malformation that could be very fatal, uh, as we've seen in a patient who died because of the cardiac arrhythmia. And the presence of polydactyl and soft tissue syndactyl could more likely be associated with the capital syndrome. However, there is a need for genetic testing to try to differentiate the other syndromes. These are my references, and thank you very much for your attention. This was a rare case from um, Tanzania. As you can see, we have received a lot of interesting and rare cases this uh, competition. Moving on to our 16th case for, from Dr. Isa Muhammad from Nigeria. He will be presenting a case of a retrocaval ureter. Good morning, organizers, listeners, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm Dr. Isa Hassan Muhammad from the Department of Radiology, Yorba State University Teaching Hospital, Nigeria. My mentor is Professor Anes Ismail, and these are my team members. I'm to present the case report, retrocarbal urethra, an incidental finding of a rare cause of hydrodeposis in adults. A 41-year-old male presented with history of recurrent dull left flank pain of two years duration. He has received several treatment for pyelonephritis due to the left uh, symptoms. However, he doesn't have any symptoms on the right side. He is otherwise normal and all examination, general and abdominal examination were normal. Laboratory investigation are also normal. However, the last abdominal ultrasound scan performed shows bilateral hydronephrosis was on the right side. The managing physician suspected renal calculi, which prompted him to, co to perform computed tomographic urography. This is a coroner reformatted CT urogram shown moderate hydronephrosis on the right side. The left side shows mild fullness. This is another coronary reformatted computed tomographic urogram shows contrast pooling in the renal pelvis and the proximal ureter. The distal aspect of this uh, ureter shows uh, compression behind the inferior vena cava and it shows a typical hook shape or reverse j shape appearance. This is an axial computed tomogram, urography, which shows the compressed aspect of the ureter behind, of the right ureter behind the inferior vena cava and the dilated segment of the ureter. These are 3D volume image in a secretory piece of the computer tomographic urogram showed uh, the earlier described dilated segment of the proximal urethra, the renal pelvis, and the moderate hydronephrosis. The distal aspect at the level of T C L3 vertebra shows a typical hook shape, fish hook appearance, or reverse J-shape appearance. Our patient presented is in early portis without any symptoms. This is typical, typically seen in most of the patients, and that's the reason. for a low incidence. This patient presented with left plank pain, and he has, this may be due to poorly treated pyelonephritis and uh, due to repeated uh, recurrent urinary tract infection. So due to the absence of symptoms and the presence of adequate excretory function on the right side, our patient was given no surgical option for the time being. He was placed on monthly follow-up ultrasound scan to assess the severity of hydroprosis and yearly IVU to assess for renal function. So there are so many variants of a circumcarbal or retrocarbal ureter. However, radiologically, it is being classified as type one and type two. Type one is a typical, which demonstrated in this our patient, uh, in which the CT urogram will show uh, classical reverse J or fish hook OC host appearance. In type two, it is milder uh, with less medialization of the ureter. Take home point. Let's know that retrocarbal ureter is a rare congenital abnormality. In terms of differential diagnosis, after excluding renal calculus, calculi, the most important differentials are retroperitoneal masses and the retroperitoneal fibrosis, which have their typical appearance on urography. The low clinical incident of this uh, disease is likely due to asymptomatic nature in most of the patients. A spiral CT scan 
as demonstrated in this case, is a prepared method of identifying IBC anomalies and coda retrocarbal urotheric anomalies. These are my references. Thank you very much for listening. Another interesting case, uh, just as a reminder, everyone, stick around because we are going to be pulling up displaying uh, the polls for you to vote for your favorite case. Uh, moving on to our 17th case from Ethiopia, Dr. Misiker Gebre Mariam will be presenting a case of isolated renal hydrated cyst. Uh, welcome to the uh, case presentation. Uh, I'm Dr. Mr. Kabramaram, third year uh, radiology resident at uh, Addis Ababa University, Tukurambasa Hospitals. My mentor is Dr. Samuel Cisahelo, a, pediatri a pediatrics radiology subspecialist. And uh, the case is on isolated renal eye disease in a 10 years old female child. And uh, I have no any uh, disclosure. So the outline is that we try to present a case presentation and the discussion and finally the reference. The case presentation and the, the, the 10, year, 10 years old female child present to our hospital with one man's history of uh, right flank pain with progressive uh, uh, worsening of the pain and she has no trauma history, urinary complaint or any fever. And the physical examination shows right costal vertebral anger tenderness without palpable uh, swelling. The urine analysis was not revealing, a renal function test is also normal. And she was sent to the radiologic side, to our side, and the ultrasound was done. This is a transverse uh, scan at, at the level of uh, uh, right flank regions and uh, anteriorly. And uh, uh, that this also shows the longitudinal scan which shows the, there is well-defined cystic lesion with a double wall sign and the internal low-level ecodebris, and the cyst also shows posterior enhancement. <clears throat> and uh, uh, without impression of uh, uh, renal hydratid cyst, again, CT scan pre and post contrast was done. And uh, the, the CT, uh, or this is this are an actual image at different level at the showing uh, uh, well-defined cystic lesions with uh, double wall sign, even this, this could be seen in the non-contrast study. The cyst does not show any uh, post-contrast uh, uh, enhancement or uh, does not show any internal uh, enhancing uh, content. And uh, again, there is no surrounding inflammatory change or any surrounding enhancement to suggest any evidence of abscess or any a possible complication. And the final diagnosis and uh, management isolated, uh, the final diagnosis was isolated renal, uh, right renal hydratis cyst, and uh, uh, the management was admitted and uh, operated with uh, uh, in our case, open surgery was done, and uh, uh, was done, and this was the post-op uh, finding, uh, showing the cyst content, and the size is similar to the finding that is seen in the CT and uh, ultrasound. And uh, the treatment options, as a general, uh, could be medical percutaneous procedure or open surgery. But surgical intervention is the main method of treatment and can take a form of complete removal of the cyst with a persistectomy or partial or complete nephrectomy, depending on the involvement and damage of the remaining functional parenchyma. Because uh, our patient uh, does not, in our case, does not show any significant involvement of the renal parenchymas, the percutaneous uh, persistectomy uh, uh, was uh, done. <clears throat> General to say isolated renal hydratid cyst. Its hydratid cyst is a zoonotic disease caused by uh, cystoids echinococcus, especially echinococcus granulosus. Uh, currently in Ethiopia, there was limited there is a limited uh, uh, study about the prevalence, and because it, they are not considered a significant medical condition in in, in our country, and the study from different parts of uh, uh, Ethiopia's have given an estimated incidence of around uh, 0 0.5 to 2.3, uh, with the liver being the most commonly affected. 
uh, organ and spleen and kidneys counting for 11 in 77 percent uh, respectively and uh, in general renal localization of hydatidis is rare only two percent of cases are uh, are uh, children's and most are uni unilateral, uh, often located in upper pole, similar to our case. Uh, and isolated renal hydatidis is extremely rare clinical uh, condition associated with non-specific symptoms and physical finding. And the diagnosis can be difficult. Uh, and depending on uh, imaging finding, histology examination of uh, excised uh, tissue uh, uh, specimens. So. Uh, high index of in, uh, suspicion with the constellation of imaging findings will be supportive to reach to the final diagnosis. In conclusion, renal hydatidis is a rare in, in clinical practice and difficult to diagnose. Also, multimodal imaging combined with clinical suspicion can be helpful. Uh, it should be considered in differential diagnosis of uh, cystic renal mass in child children from endemic areas to make a timely diagnosis and uh, plan proper management. Uh, also, rare corrective preoperative diagnosis is essential to uh, optimize medical management prior to the surgery, uh, to follow up proper surgical technique and to avoid uh, aggressive uh, mismanagement. And uh, in our case, <coughs> the patient was put on uh, post-operative uh, 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 albendazole and uh, she was ha has been followed for a uh, few months and the patient does not develop any post-op complication and she uh, was uh, clinically fine and uh, there is no radiological evidence of any hydatid uh, in other uh, part of the body including the lung and the uh, livers and also a similar in the similar organ and she she is uh, doing okay these are the clinic uh, the reference that, that I, I used uh, uh, and also uh, thank you thank you everyone for staying around and learning with us about all of these interesting topics interesting images um now moving on to our eighth 18th case uh, from Tenwek Hospital, Kenya. Dr. Bethleen Waisiko will be presenting a case of a rare retroperitoneal mass. Hi, everyone. My name is Bethleen Waisiko, a pediatric surgery resident at Tenwek Hospital, Kenya. I'm making this presentation in collaboration with my mentor and team members on the diagnosis and management of a rare retroperitoneal mass in a new unit. We do not have any disclosures. Uh, this is a case of a five week old female baby that was referred to our hospital with the concern of an abdominal mass. Her parents had noted an increase in abdominal distension with intermittent discomfort during bowel movement. The baby had passed meconium within 24 hours of birth. She was tolerating breastfeeding and had good weight gain. She had no fevers or respiratory distress or difficulty in passing urine. She weighed 3.7 kgs at birth and presented at 5.8 kgs. On physical examination, her vitals were within normal limits. She had a soft, non-tender right upper quadrant mass that was palpable. An abdominal ultrasound was obtained, which showed a round mixed density right retroperitoneal mass with fluid and echogenic fat within it. It was displacing the liver. An abdominal pelvic CT scan was subsequently obtained that showed a right retroperitoneal mass that was displacing the inferior vena cava and the right kidney. This mass had mixed fat, calcium, and fluid attenuation within it as shown on the coronal image. It spanned from the inferior edge of the liver to the pelvis. In consultation with our radiologist, a provisional diagnosis of mature teratoma was made. Beta HCG and alpha fetoprotein levels were done, with their results being within normal range for the patient's age. The baby was subsequently admitted to the newborn unit and prepared for laparotomy with tumor excision. Preoperative uh, markings of the tumor margins were done as shown on the image, and a transverse supraumbilical incision was made. 
Uh, the tumor was found to be adherent to segment eight of the liver with feeding vessels that were draining to that segment. It also had feeding vessels that were draining to the right rhinal hilum as shown by the asterisk. All the feeding vessels were ligated. The right kidney and the right adrenal gland were spared and the tumor was subsequently excised whole with its capsule intact. Postoperatively, this patient was admitted to the neonated, neonatal intensive care unit with close monitoring of her vitals. She began breastfeeding on post-op day two, and she continued to do well being discharged from post-operative day three. Uh, we reviewed her three weeks later in our surgical outpatient clinic and her parents expressed no concerns. Her vitals were within normal limits, her incision was intact, and she had no abdominal tenderness. On pathology examination, the tumor weighed about half a kg, and on gross section showed uh, partly cystic lesion that was filled with serous fluid. It had areas of cartilage and bone formation with a rudimentary vertebral column, which is shown by the arrow. And on histology, a vertebral morphology and mature neural tissue was seen. Therefore, final diagnosis of fetus in fetu was made. Uh, fetus in fetu is a rare congenital anomaly with an incidence of about one is to half a million births. It has been described as the presence of a malformed parasitic twin in the body of a normally developed host. It is proposed to occur due to the unequal division of totipotent cells within the blastocyst, which then persists to form a vestigial remnant de developing fetus, and it is most commonly located in the retroperitoneal region. It is usually a benign pathology for which complete excision is curative. However, there have been case reports um, of malignant transformation later on, which have raised the concerns that this could be uh, part of a teratoma spectrum. Therefore, appropriate imaging and pathology are key to the diagnosis, management, and subsequent follow-up of these patients. Uh, this therefore calls for a multidisciplinary approach in their care with close collaboration of the pediatric surgeon, radiologist, and pathologist, as was the case for our patients. We intend to continue with close outpatient monitoring uh, for this baby. Uh, this is a sample of the reference studies within this presentation and some of the members that were uh, involved in the care and management of our patients. Thank you very much. A really interesting and rare case from uh, Dr. Bethleen. Um, so uh, moving on, Dr. Aneth Denise from Tanzania, Mohimbi University of Health and Allied Sciences, will be presenting a case of a noisy breathing infant. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Aneth Soy from Mohimbi National Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So today, I'll be presenting a case of a one-month-old East African infant who was delivered at term to a 41-year-old woman via caesarean section because the mother had a prior history of a previous scar. The baby was delivered with 3.2 kg with a good APGA score of 9 to 10 in the first and fifth minute. The baby presented to us with a history of noisy breathing and the mother reported started soon after birth and it was worsened when feeding and when crying and it was accompanied with difficulty in breathing as well as feeding difficulties there was a lot of interruptions during breastfeeding however the mother reports there was no history of fever no vomiting no cough no bleach discoloration or any choking so in past medical history, the pregnancy of the mother was uneventful. There was no infections reported, no medical illnesses that were recorded. Both the prenatal period and the natal period were uneventful. However, the mother has a history of losing twin siblings about three years ago due to complications of prematurity. So the index is the only child in the family. When the baby presented to us, the baby was alert in respiratory distress. The baby was very tachypneic with 67 breaths per minute. If she had loud biphasic strider with mild subcostal recessions. And on auscultation, the baby had bronchovesicular breath sounds with wheezing. The rest of the systemic examination was unremarkable. So despite the feeding difficulties on GI examination, there was no swollen abdomen, the urine output was adequate, the stool, 
So also on, at, in the heart examination, on palpation, asphaltation, there was no any abnormality that was detected. So based on the signs and symptoms, we thought this should be a congenital malformation. So we came up with laryngomalacia or bronchomalacia based on the symptoms because the baby had strider with the noisy breathing, with the early presentation of the symptoms. So we tried positioning of the child during feeding. Since we know with laryngomalacia, when you lie the child supine, the symptoms worsen. So we tried to put the child in a better position during feeding, but the symptoms did not improve. We also did suction and nebulization just to relieve the child of any secretions that could cause an obstruction, but it really did not improve the symptoms. So based on this, we went to further diagnose the child and that's when we did a plain radiograph, chest radiograph. And what you could observe was the narrowing of the upper third of the trachea. However, the lump parenchyma was normal. There was no infiltration, no cystic changes, no consolidation. So because of the narrowing of the trachea and the symptoms of strider and the noisy breathing, we thought there should be something compressing the trachea. So this further led us to do a CT scan. And on CT scan, we noticed that the baby has double aortic arc. This is the right one, this is the left one, forming a complete vascular ring. And in return, it caused compression of the structures in between. So there's a significant compression of the trachea. So, Based on the signs and symptoms, the investigation, we came up with a diagnosis of double aortic arc with compression of the trachea. And double aortic arc is a very rare congenital cardiovascular malformation. And if it wasn't for the CT scan, we would not come up with such a diagnosis because strider, noisy breathing could have multiple differentials. But thanks for the radiological investigation, we're able to completely specify what the child was suffering from. It is it happens when two aortic arc come together to form a complete vascular ring, causing compression of the trachea and the esophagus. So the symptoms are also related to the compression. So if you compress the trachea, they'll strider, wheezing, respiratory distress, and compression of the esophagus would cause dysphagia and feeding difficulty. And double aortic arc occurs due to failure of regression of the right fourth primitive arc. Because we know during embryology, the aortic sac divides into six pairs of aortic arches and they tend to regress. So the fourth primitive arc is the one, the left one is the one that forms the aortic arc. But then the right one is just meant to form the subclavian artery and then it regresses. But if it doesn't regress, what happens? It forms the double aortic arc. So diagnosis, you can suspect it when you do a chest x-ray because you'll see the narrowing of the trachea. It will give you a curiosity that there's something compressing the trachea. If you also do a barium esophagram, esoph esophagogram, you can also notice there's narrowing of the esophagus, but you can actually confirm only when you do a CT of the chest. So the mainstay of treatment is surgery soon after diagnosis, and that's what our patient is also awaiting, surgical intervention. So one of the arc will be divided, usually the anterior one, because it is usually smaller information, at the point where it joins to the descending out. So this was the reference that we used for our case. And thank you for listening. Thanks for the attendees for uh, staying with us. Um, so we're up to our final two presentations. Uh, this presentation is from Iran, uh, the only representative of the Middle East in this competition. Uh, it's coming from Isfahan University of Medical Sciences. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nagin Faqih Dawlat Abadi will be presenting a case about cleft lip palate with midline anomalies. Uh, in the name of God, hello everyone. I'm Dr. Nagin Faqih, a radiology resident uh, in Isfahan University of Medical Science from Iran. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Amir Fendereski, and my colleague, Dr. Fesahat, um, uh, for their uh, guidance and assistance in preparing this presentation. And secondly, I uh, would like to express my gratitude to uh, Radiology Department of CHOP and uh, Penn Hospital uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to present our case. Uh, let's start. Uh, a two-year-old girl uh, 
Brief history of cleft lip and uh, palate uh, was admitted uh, to the hospital for cleft palate surgery. Previously, uh, lip, um, cleft lip uh, had been uh, um, operated when the child uh, was six months old. And uh, about past medical history was uh, significant for developmental delay. There was no chemical exposure reported by mother during, ex uh, during uh, pregnancy also no significant family history uh, of medical uh, condition uh, was noted. Uh, during a microscopic evaluation uh, before surgery, uh, a mass-like lesion uh, was seen on the uh, roof of the oral cavity uh, subjacent to a uh, warmer bone. Uh, this uh, finding uh, prompted the need uh, for further evaluation and investigation uh, concerning meningocell. In this slide, uh, coronal T2 and T3 CT scan show a cleft palate in this patient. And uh, the um, and um, this one, uh, coronal and sagittal CT um, scans uh, show uh, that uh, midline uh, fat density lesion uh, on the roof of oral cavity, which was uh, rejected and subsequently confirmed uh, to be a dermoid. And uh, the most interesting uh, slide uh, is this one, uh, that midline sagittal T2. Uh, the black arrow indicates the hypogenesis and dysplasia uh, of uh, corpus callosum. Uh, the red one um, shows abnormal hypothalamic uh, structure uh, suggestive of tubomamillary uh, fusion. And um, the last one, the yellow one, uh, show, uh, the, uh, shows the shortened dysmorphic clivus um, uh, resulting in uh, protruding a tract uh, from a cranial cavity to retropharyngeal space which contains CSF and neural elements uh, which is obvious in the picture through a dotted curve line, the, the blue arrow. Uh, and uh, this slide uh, coronal uh, and left parasagittal and axial uh, T2 sequences, uh, the tract uh, containing CSF and neural elements uh, is much more evident in this coronal, sagittal and axial T2 images. Uh, some of the study highlights, highlights the importance of evaluation the facial and brain midline structures when dealing uh, with cleft lip and uh, palate. Uh, as shown uh, in this uh, case, there seems to be an association between the development of mid, uh, midline structures, including uh, corpus callosum, tuber syndrome, mammillary body, clivus, and uh, plate. Uh, and finally, evaluation of mentioned structures can potentially change the surgical approach and predict, predict the prognosis of the disease. Thank you. Impressive case from Iran. So uh, the next case is going to be our last case before we move on to the voting section, where all the attendees will be voting to choose their favorite case. And this case will be the people will be awarded the People's Choice Award. Uh, so moving to our uh, late entry by Dr. Nathaniel Alemu Bezabi from Ethiopia. Um, he will be presenting about an interesting case called Medura Head. Hello, um, my name is Dr. Nathalie Vazabe. Uh, I'm third year clinical radiology resident in the Grand Bazaar Hospital. And I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. And the case I got the competition for is Madura Head. So let's dive into it. So our patient presented with uh, 
a progressive skull and face disfiguration and as well as swelling for the last six years and predominantly started on the left and later on he started to uh, have swelling over the right also and previously he has no um, known illness and no hypertension DM or uh, he's not reactive to the uh, retroviral infections. On physical examination, the predominant finding was um, uh, regular skull swelling and bilateral protruding of the eyes with total loss of vision on the left one. And on laboratory, we have all uh, investigations were normal and uh, the rest of physical examination was also normal. So for this complaint, our patient went on to have an MRI and here we have his axial T2 scan. And What's striking in this case is there's significant involvement of the scalp and the skull and this heterogeneous disfiguration and as well as uh, thickening of the scalp and as well as the calvarius. And um, with this heterogeneity, we see some striking features. Uh, and what we have is this um, round, uh, rounded hyperbreme intensity with central uh, low intensity on T2. And uh, this lesion is also distributed throughout the dura and the inner table. As we go further up, we can see that uh, the involvement of the skull uh, bilaterally and predominantly involving the frontal and the parietal regions. And furthermore, what we have is this rounded intraxial lesion uh, with predominantly that's T2 dark. The other thing is uh, we can see this diffuse dural enhancement in the post-contrast uh, post enhancement. It looks like a pachymeningeal enhancement with some nodularities. And this intraxial lesion shows significant contrast enhancement. Mm -hmm. What was actually helpful was the patient also had a CT scan at that time. And the CT scan, we can see significant hyperostosis of the calvaria, and especially in the inner table. And there are also some uh, lytic punched out lesions that are uh, seen on the inner table of the skull. And we can also see that there is a significant soft tissue enhancement that we see we saw on the MRI. Uh, Management-wise, the patient was taken to the OR just for debridement and to do orbital decompression of the right eye just to salvage his vision because he lost the left eye vision. And sample at that time was also taken from the scalp and the dura, and the histopathology revealed that multiple microabscesses uh, surrounded by neutrophils and uh, macrophages within the center of it, they have ground positive filamentous bacteria, uh, which is suggestive of actinomycete. And that confirms and concludes uh, a case of uh, Madura. So in this case, Madura hate. So what I would like to tell is this case actually was confirmed retrospectively after we have the histology findings. And uh, But what are the peculiar features that we can see uh, that suggest for Madura hate is uh, this is a companion case that we can see uh, from the agiform bridopedia, and we can see this multiple uh, lead punched out, small multiple punched out lithic lesions at the edge of the bones of the calcaneus. But this also can be seen in the case of the our calvarium and the inner table. These multiple punched out lithic lesions are also seen, which is very suggestive for uh, Madura head in this case. So even more suggestive sign would be circular dose sign. Circular dose sign uh, is very specific for Madura and sometimes even considered as a patinimonic sign for Madura. These circle in those signs are this hyperintensity in the outer side and having central low hypointensity, which presumably uh, represents a bacteria or the fungus in the case of uh, acetoma. So this is a case from case report. And uh, here in our lesion also, we can see these multiple uh, lesions, uh, circle in those lesions, distributed between the dura and the inner table of the calvary. And this makes it very specific for a case of uh, Madura heat. And this concludes our case of craniocerebral maduromycosis, or colorful name of Madura heat. So it's just chronic bronchitis infection that's caused by fungus or bacteria, which is extremely rare uh, when it happens in the coronary structure. And until now, only eight case reports has been reported in this case. Uh, and management-wise, what usually is going to be done is you're going to treat the bacteria or the fungus, and we're going to drip right. For our particular patients, since it's actinomycete, he started on penicillin, and with close follow-up, surgical debridement is planned. So the take-home message for this case would be always look for typical signs in 
at typical locations. In this case, we got the typical circuit dose sign and also other CT suggestive signs, but we didn't make the diagnosis first because uh, it's in a very typical location. Uh, but all the other signs are there, so always look for the typical signs. And the other one is infections could occur anywhere else in the body as long as they got what they need. And Madura, Madura's case, um, they got the bones, they got the soft tissue, so if they could happen in the food, even though it's rare, they could also have possibilities in happening uh, in other regions, so uh, also look for that. And I just want to say thank you very much. Hello. Thank you for everyone who submitted a case and thank you for the finalists for submitting uh, a really informative and educational cases. Uh, now, moving on, we will be uh, displaying the votes, the, the polls for you to vote. So just as a, uh, as a remark, you have to vote to at least one uh, case and the three questions to be able to advance. So please make sure to vote um, to at least to, to one of the cases in each of the three questions. And then after that, we will be displaying the QR code for you to provide us with some uh, uh, feedback about this session, what you liked and what you disliked, so we can improve. Thank you. Um, all right we're back we are back it's been a lot of discussions arguments advocacy begging crying a lot of emotions into choosing the winners um the only thing we can't control remember is the people's choice you know um you guys control that uh, we just uh, report the, the results so I've been um, tasked with announcing the winners um, for today. Um, I'm going to start with a third place winner. <clears throat> Dr. Zerihun Heilu from Ethiopia uh, with the case communicating bronchopulmonary foregut. Is that a uh, third place winner? Hey, um, who gets $250, right? $250. Our second place winner is Dr. Bethlin Waisiko uh, from Kenya, a rare retroperitoneal mass. Um, that was an amazing case. Um, so that's the second place winner gets um, $500, right? Uh, our people's choice, our people's choice, not to be um, forgotten, we are about the people here. Um, also, um, it uh, goes to Dr. Kibede. I'm going to stop at that because I don't want to uh, offend anybody. But um, from Liberia, um, cyst or aneurysm, the role of color flow Doppler model is our people's choice. Yay. And our first, <laughs> our first place, our winner. Everyone is a winner, but the winner of the winners, Dr. Natnail Benzabri, with the case of uh, Medura Head from Ethiopia. First place. And the first place winner gets $1,000, $1,000. So um, this is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, unfortunately, everything has to come to an end. Um, it's been a, a, a lot of work. As you can see, there's a lot of people in the, um, here who uh, put a lot of um, work in, into this, um, including our panelists, but the whole team um, from Mohammed to Yadao to Ale Alejo, um, Abbas, Hansel, Sydney, Herman, Monica. Um, I, I know I'm missing one or two people, so please forgive me. So. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out uh, with us um, same time um, next year. But um, in the meantime, our next uh, case competition is going to be for Latin America and the Caribbean in a few months. So please um, come back and um, see um, and connect with your colleagues from other parts of the world. But thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. Well, don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Um, I've just been told that um, there's going to be a survey. Um, come on. 
is there going to be a survey for, for people? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daku. <laughs> right. So don't leave. Uh, there's going to be a survey uh, link sent to you so we can get some uh, feedback, but I'm leaving. So take care. <laughs>